recommend that the microphones are hot and they're going to be hot throughout and also um, for other folks including all of our team in the room uh, the microphones pick up everything around the room so please be aware of that especially also because we're live streaming and it, it would be helpful to uh, keep other noise other than the speaker um, down so that the live streaming works. We also welcome again our fabulous graphic facilitator and longtime Institute for the Future affiliate, Anthony <laughs> Beach, who takes the magic that you say and puts a, makes the magic on paper. Um, and as always, if you see that Anthony has missed anything that needs to be included, he invites you to come up and let him know that so we keep a good graphic record. Um, the camera is in the in the back for live streaming. Um, Wi-Fi access is on the table, so if you have any uh, issues, please let us know. Bathrooms are over there to my left, uh, and then all of the meetings, as always, are open for public comment. There are comment cards on the seats. Please fill them out, and then you can put them into the basket, and we will do the public comment. There's the basket, uh, and we'll take the uh, public comment at the end. So as always, one of our favorite parts of the meeting is we're going to go around and have the commissioners introduce themselves. And um, because it is January, it's our first meeting of 2020, what we're going to ask you to do is give us your one word for 2020. Th thank you, Julie. Hi, everybody. My word for 2020 is opportunity. Who are you? Yeah. James Manika, opportunity. <laughs> uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Mariana Vitudo, and uh, my word for 2020 is um, victory. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tom Khalil, my one word is meliorism which if you don't know what that word means, it's not, it's a belief that things can get better, but only if we work at it. Mm. Wow. Good morning, uh, I'm Betty Yee, and my word for 2020 is uh, elevate. Lance Hastings word, uh, interesting. <laughs> Hello? Hello? I'm Sarah J. Raman, AKA America's worst boss, <laughs> according to the track outside. And so since I'm the worst, you can only go up from there. So my word is up. <laughs> hey, 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 uh, I'm Jennifer Granholm, my word is hope. Carla Javits, I'll go with engage. Art Pulaski, my hyphenated word is charge ahead. <laughs> I'm John Marshall, and uh, I was going to say uh, victory like Mariana, but I'll, I'll consider it and say crossroads instead. Hi, I'm Soraya Coley. My word is impatient. <clears throat> I'm Roy Bahat, and despite the state for which we are all convened in honor of my wife's home state, my word is Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> Doug Brock, I'm going to go with Governor Granholm and use hope. Maria Salinas. Okay, no, but Maria Salinas, um, my word would be collaborate. Uh, Mary Kay Henry, my word is optimistic. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Um, we were able to see uh, many of you. There were eight of the commissioners who attended our event last night. Um, that was amazing. And we'll hear a little bit more about that um, later in the day. But it was the first time we held an event prior to the convening to give the commissioners a chance to come together with uh, important folks in the local area where we're meeting in order to advance the conversation, hear some insights on some of the issues that have become uh, in important in, in these gatherings. And so just really grateful to the commissioners who made the time um, and to Saru who, uh, who planted the idea and helped us to put that together uh, and to let everyone else who was not there just let you know that you missed a really great party. Uh, and it really was a, um, an example of the spirit behind this entire commission, which is the notion that um, we 
can all together uh, move ahead, make California better, that our ability to uh, speak to each other and speak across um, uh, our, our constituencies and interests and, um, and to find common ground here in California is going to build uh, the, the economy and uh, the communities that we want. And so um, that's also the spirit in which we enter uh, uh, today's uh, convening. Um, I'm just gonna very quickly walk through the agenda so everyone knows what to expect today. Um, after we uh, do some quick opening, we're going to hear, uh, we have amazing speakers today, but our first panel is gonna be on data in the workplace, a new frontier of employment law, followed by our second panel, which is labor law for a new economy, fixing a broken system. Uh, we are then going to break for lunch and then we will hear from the business roundtable on redefining the purpose of corporations, perspectives from large employers. Um, following a break, we are then going to go into our afternoon engagement uh, sessions. Uh, and um, it, during, in the first part of that, we are actually going to be um, reviewing the problem statement document which you've received and which is in your packet. And then we're also gonna hear a report back from um, Carla, on behalf of Carla and Maria, who uh, had a stakeholder conversation. Um, and then we'll hear a report back from Governor Granholm on last night's um, convening, uh, last night's event as well. Um, and then we're gonna have really rich discussions with all of you on pivoting toward solutions. So um, that's the agenda for the day. Uh, I'm just very, very happy to welcome back to our convenings our illustrious co-chairs, James and Mary Kay, uh, who are uh, back in the conversation, have been briefed on what happened in December, and are going to lead us forward. So James and Mary Kay, I'll turn this over to you. Well, Secretary, thank you very much for the opening and the kickoff. We're delighted and happy new year, everybody. I think we can still keep saying that for a little bit longer, uh, uh, keep our optimistic spirits up. Um, we wanted just to take a moment to reflect a little bit on where we are as a commission. Uh, I think we've, uh, if we think about our process here, which has been, you know, we we, we're kind of halfway through halfway through to where we need to end up for the interim output, which is going to be in April. Uh, we have spent a fair amount of time talking amongst ourselves, listening to ourselves and each other and the perspectives and issues we have in our minds. Uh, we've also heard a lot from experts and people who've come in to speak to us. Uh, we've also uh, seen a lot of documents, <laughs> a lot of data. Uh, we've been presented with a lot of data uh, that point to many of the issues that we see. And we've also done, I think, something quite extraordinary in this commission, which is to actually listen to workers. Uh, we still have not done enough of that, I think, but we've done some of that, and I think we are, we're gonna keep doing more of that. And also we're gonna do some other listening to hear from other constituents that we haven't fully heard of. But I think we've, uh, we, we've had a remarkable process of actually hearing a lot of what are the issues, and I'll use my favorite word for 2020, opportunities uh, for, uh, for California. So it feels to us as if uh, it was important at this stage to try and capture uh, the challenges, the problems that we've heard so far from all that input and listening and talking to each other. And that's what uh, we've tried to capture in the uh, problem statement. Uh, and again, I'll use my 2020 word, the opportunity statement, uh, because I think those are all opportunities for us to do some extraordinary things that will benefit uh, workers and the economy of California. Uh, so what we've got now at this stage is a sense of, that's what we try to capture uh, uh, in that problem or opportunity statement, which is what are the things that we hope to address uh, for California's future? Uh, I also come back to the point that we're kind of halfway through our process. I think an important part of why we're all here and an important part of what we're trying to do is to actually get actionable. I think we it'd be quite easy, this is an enormous state, it is after all the fifth largest economy in the world. We could spend an enormous and inordinate amount of time analyzing the challenges and the issues uh, and never get to, I think, the reason why we're all here, which is to get to actions and solutions and recommendations. So it is our sense, at least given our process of where we wanna end up and the time that we spent so far to pivot a bit, uh, to at least try and devote most of, most of our energies 
to actually coming up with solutions and actions for what we think needs to happen in California. So we hope that this is a moment, it's a new year after all, but we hope that it's a moment of pivot, a moment for us to shift, uh, if, if for no other reason that we have to get to the end goal. Uh, you know, April's not that far away. We have an enormous amount of work to do. Uh, if we're going to get to coming up with a set of recommendations and actions uh, for California. So we hope that uh, as a commission, we kind of make that mental shift, if we like. I mean, there's, I'm sure we'll still need to keep refining the problem and, and incorporating inputs and so forth. But I think we, it's time to make the shift to devote the majority of our energies to developing recommendations. Thank you, James. And I just wanted to um, underscore James' core message with the commissioners and um, uh, signal a specific technique that we want to use uh, this afternoon. And I just wanted to begin by saying that um, Secretary Sue's insistence on these questions each time we've mm -hmm. started um, I think has uh, developed a way for me to think about this commission being a intentional convening of civil society across California that actually has a shot at doing something that a lot of us talk about around the country but haven't actually been able to make happen. And um, that's this ambitious goal of creating a new social compact that's in the interests of employers and the business community, workers, government and the next generation, um, which I just find incredibly both exciting but humbling. And I have to admit to you that I came to this commission thinking I was gonna push my ideas. And what I've learned in the, in the work of these first four convenings is that I have a lot to learn from people that the governor uh, selected that I haven't had the privilege to engage with before but have developed a relationship that has opened my mind in thinking about my ideas being enriched by your experience and thinking. And that's why I think this, this pivot that James just referred to is so key. Because I know from all of you in the little break times in the previous four meetings, people are like, when are we gonna get to the action? When are we gonna, remember that? Like, that keeps emerging and it's, this is the opportunity, sisters and brothers. We're going to get to it this afternoon. And I think what um, James and I did in this opening letter when we moved the problem statement out was try and say, we believe this captures what we've heard from commissioners over the previous four months. And we're interested in people's comment ab about direction. But what we don't think is productive for us is to line edit. Uh, the document. And I just wanted to say that explicitly at the top. And if people, um, I think that's sort of the heart of what we want to do. We want to check that judgment with you uh, when we open the afternoon session after we get through the panels this morning that Secretary Sue uh, just outlined. And then I just want to say that um, the shift that I've heard nationally and that Anish uh, Roman reminded me of when I walked in this morning is all the future of work uh, commissions and reports that have occurred around the world in Europe, uh, in uh, Latin America, South America, and there are several happening simultaneously with ours. The thing that I've heard reflected back about what's emerging from the conversation here in California is that we are shifting the global discussion from um, a preoccupation with technology and automation as the focal point to human beings and working people. And that that's a really important shift that this commission can be incredibly proud of that I think is, uh, Anish and Anmol might know better, but I think is uh, kind of filtering back into other uh, collaborations. And I think that shift is going to manifest itself in the set of recommendations and solutions that uh, we're able to put forward by April. So this afternoon will be the launch uh, for the beginning of the solutions frame that we're gonna add to February, March, and then synthesize in a final report in April. Anything else, James, that I've missed? No, I think uh, we're both very excited about where we are. And, and thank you, by the way, for all the work and input that we received from all of you, but also from others who've sent information to the commission. It's been extraordinarily valuable, and even 
thankful for the public that has also contributed ideas in this. I think part of what Mary Kay and I uh, were talking about is that it's going to be important to keep that process of input going because while we will have ideas ourselves as commissioners, there'll be others out there who also have ideas. So we're going to think about mechanisms to make sure we keep getting inputs on ideas of, for solutions. Uh, but one of the things, back to Mary Kay's point about civil society, I think it is our sense, and this commission reflects that, that the more you know, integrated, societally oriented they are, that draw from all our different experiences, the better we think the solutions are going to be for the state of California. So with that, I think we're going to go and uh, get started with the, with the next part of our agenda. So we hand that back to you, Julie. Thank, Thank you. you so much, James and Betty Jay. Just want to reiterate how lovely it is to help you both back. All right. So our first panel today is on data in the workplace, a new frontier in employment law. And Pauline and Ifoma, who are our speakers, both come from outside of California. So they've flown in both for last night's event and to be here today. And they're both incredibly accomplished and pioneers in their field. And their field is generally the role of technology and AI in the workplace, big data, the blurring of work and private life, and the role and limits of law. So instead of going through their um, their bios, I'm just gonna let everyone know that a simple list of the titles of their scholarship and presentations is like a required syllabus for the commission. Uh, Pauline, for example, has written on data-driven discrimination at work and electronic privacy and employee speech, in addition to textbooks on employment law. And Ifoma's works include limitless worker surveillance, hiring by algorithm, and her upcoming book, the quantify. So you don't have to read everything that they've written uh, to do the work we have here because you get to hear from them live. This, this discussion is particularly exciting because it gives us a chance to dive into some of the issues that have already surfaced among the commission, to talk to experts about it, and to really think about that intersection of technology, data, and work. Um, the thread that is not so much about how technology will, um, will or will not replace workers, but about its use in the workplace and what that means. Uh, the risks, dangers, opportunities, and interventions. A conversation that reflects something that I know that you all care a lot about. So I'm gonna jump right in and have a question first for Pauline. Pauline, please tell us uh, about the growing role of data, its collection, use, incorporation into AI in the workplace, how is data affecting humans at work? Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, I'm delighted uh, to be able to address you um, and to raise some of these really important issues. Um, is, is the mic on? Okay, and so, um, I, and I really appreciate the way that you teed it up because there has been a lot of discussion about robots, are they taking all our jobs? There's been important discussions about fissuring of the work relationship, but I'm talking about something different, which is assuming that we have work relationships in the future, which I think we will, the question really I'm focused on is how is the growing use of data and AI in the workplace going to affect um, that workplace? And in particular, what impact will it have on workers? So um, this is... All right, so these are my slides. Um, so I want to, what I'm going to do, I um, try to get through this really quickly at a very high level, and I'm happy to go back and um, dig deeper into any of these topics. Um, but I'm going to focus on um, three different areas of impact um, that are raised by this growing use of data in AI. Um, the first is the increase in monitoring and surveillance activity by employers. The second is the risk of discrimination and bias in the use of these technologies. Those two focus on sort of the employer role and use of data. And the third is the risk of unequal access to employment opportunities because of the growing role of labor market intermediaries. Um, and so for each of these, I'm gonna to try to present uh, a brief example, talk about um, some of the challenges they raise, and then briefly highlight some of the legal um, concerns or the ways in which the law that we have today isn't adequate to address these issues. Um, so uh, without getting too much into the legal details. So the first issue is surveillance and monitoring. 
Um, the growth of technology permits employers increasingly to collect detailed information about employees off the job, on the job, um, increase the level of monitoring that can go on. So the example here I have is um, sociometric badges. Um, these are badges which employees may be required to wear at work, which will track their location throughout the day. In addition, it will record information about who they interact with, how long they speak to one another, who initiates the conversation, what tone of voice, and so on. Um, these do not record the contents of the conversation, but a lot of metadata of, about everything else about the interactions. So employers want to use these um, to promote collaboration among workers, to figure out who's a leader, to effectively deploy them. But the data collected can also be used for surveillance. It can be used to discipline employees. They raise concerns about autonomy and fairness. The other thing about these um, tools is as the data gets more and more granular and it's in the hands of the employer, it allows the employer to extract more value from the employee, which potentially adds to the um, concerns about inequality. And then finally, because even though each piece of data that is collected may be relatively sort of an innocuous piece of data, when you put it together with all of the other data and you analyze it in a much larger data set, um, this data can be used to infer other types of information about employees. For example, do they have a medical problem? Um, is, there a, is there a lead person here who's sort of starting to organize workers to talk about working conditions and so on? Um, so those are some of the concerns. Um, the law is not really well prepared to deal with these issues. For, to start with, the law does not do a lot to protect employee privacy. And to the extent that it does, it tends to focus on certain... Uh, what are soon to be highly sensitive pieces of information and to try to protect that. But as I said earlier, part of the problem with the, with the growth of data and the use of AI is that individual pieces of information may not be, may be quite trivial, but it's really when it's aggregated that it can produce um, information that is more threatening to employee privacy. Um, and the other um, issue in the privacy context um, is that under existing law, in most cases, if the employee consents to the collection and use of the information, that's it, that's all the employer needs. And given the inequality of the um, inequality in bargaining power in the employment relationship, most employees are going to consent. Um, so the next issue is, um, I wanna talk about is bias and discrimination. Um, employers are increasingly using hiring algorithms. They're collecting lots of data beyond the typical resume, analyzing that data and using it to predict who's gonna be the best employee. So one of the examples here that got some fair amount of publicity was when Amazon tried to build an algorithm to identify the best software developers. They collected lots of data about lots of people and they compared it to their current workforce. And the problem is their current workforce of software developers was largely male and so the algorithm mostly recommended other males to be hired as software developers. Um, there are a lot of employers, many, many employers, especially large employers, are relying on these hiring algorithms now. And depending on how they are constructed, they raise this risk of prior biases being uh, reincorporated um, and reproduced. Um, I'm not saying that they all do that, but without more transparency, it's very difficult to know exactly what's going on. So um, once again, there's a number of ways in which the law is not really quite prepared to deal with these issues. There are, of course, anti-discrimination laws. Um, part of the problem is they tend to focus on intentional discrimination. And the problem here is it doesn't do any good to tell an algorithm don't consider race and gender because there's so much data that there are many proxies for those characteristics. You can reproduce the same same effect. And I'm happy to talk about studies um, on that um, later if you'd like. Um, there is a disparate impact theory, and that might be of some use here, where uh, there's a practice that appears to be neutral, but it has a discriminatory effect. Um, that disparate impact theory is under some challenge, and so that is something that would need to be strengthened if that were to be a real avenue of recourse. But even if we assume that disparate impact theory would apply in this context, there's still some really practical problems for the individual who thinks they might have been discriminated against by one of these hiring algorithms. In order to figure that out, they need an enormous amount of data and they need technical resources to do the analysis and figure it out. The other thing that's challenging from a legal perspective is usually when you have a disparate impact case, when somebody's challenging a neutral practice, 
the legality of that is really going to turn on whether the employer has a good justification for the particular practice. And with these in increasingly complex machine learning algorithms, it's often really difficult to sort out exactly what's going on, why it's having the effect it is, and whether the practice is justifiable or not. Okay, so the third example I wanted to talk about is the role of intermediaries um, in the labor market. So tech intermediaries are playing an increasingly important role in matching job seekers with potential job opportunities. Um, the um, many, many employers now advertise on online platforms like Facebook or Google when they have a job opening. Um, many of them rely on job matching platforms where they post a job and job seekers will go and post their resumes and the, match, the platform will try to help them find a good match. So I'm going to use Facebook as an example here about how this problem, have a, how access to opportunities may not be equally distributed. Um, Facebook got some bad press for allowing employers and landlords to use demographic characteristics like gender and age to target their ads. And there was a big settlement in March of 2019. Facebook agreed that it would no longer let these types of advertisements be targeted on a demographic basis. So they, ag they agreed to create a separate portal for housing and employment ads that you couldn't use age, gender, or any kind of attribute that was sort of correlated with, say, racial or ethnic identity. So that's my little example on the, on the left side. So you have a, now when an employer wants to post a job, they pick a targeted audience, it's gotta be neutral because they can't use these um, demographic characteristics. The problem is, even though the targeted population may be neutral, the actual people who see the ad will not necessarily be, because Facebook uses an algorithm just to decide who within the targeted audience is actually going to see the ad. Um, and in fact, there has been some empirical evidence that the problem continues to persist. Um, um, this is, it's probably too small to see there, but this is an example of a Facebook ad that was posted by a construction company. They were looking for truck drivers. They targeted the ad in a gender neutral way. And then when they got their stats back from Facebook, which is the, the image on the right side, it showed that over 20,000 impressions had been served to different users of Facebook and 85% of them were men. And this is when the employer had set out to have the ad delivered on a gender neutral basis. So um, once again, this phenomenon re raises some challenges for the law. Um, first, um, there's the question of whether these intermediaries, the online advertising and job matching platforms are even covered by discrimination law. There's an argument they are, but there's some uncertainty around that. And the second issue is even if they are covered by anti-discrimination law, um, they are going to claim immunity under Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. And I won't get into that here, but if anyone wants to know more about it, I'm happy to talk about it. So um, I was asked to speak brief briefly about possible recommendations and moving forward. Um, I'm not going to have anything really concrete, just a couple general thoughts. Um, <clears throat> I think legislating in this area is very difficult because of the rapid pace of technological change. And I think it's important to be, cons to be wary of unintended consequences and premature safe harbor. So let me explain that briefly. In terms of unintended consequences, um, oftentimes people's first reaction when they hear about the risk of bias is to say, let's regulate so that the people who use these cannot include any variable that captures race, gender, age, and so on. The problem is if you take that out, not only have you not gotten rid of the problem because there are proxies in the data, but you can actually make the problem worse, right? You can make the, the, uh, the algorithm less fair across groups and you can make it more difficult to audit. And that um, is problematic for that reason. Um, the other caution, I think, and again, this relates to the HUD proposal, and also I think there was a California resolution that was passed last year um, that urged policymakers to promote development and use of hiring technologies that were, will reduce bias and discrimination. I think it's a really, um, it's a wonderful aspiration. The problem is if the, um, if, if the legislature moves too far forward in terms of promoting certain technologies, and providing defenses to those who use them without fully understanding the technologies, uh, there is a risk of freezing into place a regulatory structure that actually does not allow 
uh, the public to really understand and diagnose what's going on um, with some of these systems. So rather than um, to offer any specific um, suggestions, I want to just lay out some general principles. Um, I think creating transparency mechanisms for creating more transparency about how employers are using data, how they're collecting it, is incredibly important. Um, if there are ways to support and facilitate third parties who want to research and find out what are the effects on the ground of these kinds of technologies, I think that's incredibly important. I think diversifying the tech industry um, is a really important step in terms of getting the people in the room who are developing these technologies to be thinking about some of these issues in terms of um, bias and fairness. And finally, this um, may be kind of obvious, but I think it, empowering workers to participate in this discussion is very important. The, uh, their technology and AI has a potential for good and a potential for bad. And a lot of it has to do with how the problem is defined. And if the only people who are defining the problems to be solved by technology are people who are interested in the bottom line, you're gonna get one kind of result. If you can involve workers and other stakeholders in, in the discussion about what is the problem that the technology should be solving, you'll get a different kind of solution. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Pauline. So if, Oma, if you have anything to add on the, the, the state of things, we'd love to hear them. But uh, as the co chairs mentioned this morning, we are really pivoting in this conversation to solutions. Uh, and so um, uh, Pauline has urged us not to rush to certain solutions um, and that potentially legislation is not um, the only answer. So I want to ask you, how does the law help or not in addressing the issues that have been raised? and what recommendations should this um, commission consider? And I just wanna know um, a thread through the work that we've had, which is at the very, very first convening, you may all recall that we heard from Eric Guillen, who was a warehouse worker who talked about the impact that Pauline just mentioned, which is what happens when you use surveillance to um, dehumanize and speed up work and what the impact is on workers. And so we'd love just to hear your thoughts on all that. Uh, so thank you very much. And, and first I'd like to thank um, uh, but you and and Mo Chattel and um, the rest of the conveners for inviting me. Um, I think this commission is so necessary, and I especially appreciate the focus on a near future of work, which is really thinking about the the way that automation is impacting workers in the workplace, and not necessarily just thinking about how automation will replace jobs, which um, I think is an important focus. But we also have to think about in the short term how um, automation will impact workers. And so I really appreciate the framing of this commission for this. Um, so, so to sort of um, continue where uh, my colleague left off, um, I, I just wanted to really focus on two issues um, that I think will be really uh, major issues for workers in the coming years. And, you know, as um, Professor Kim described, um, a major one is AI and uh, the use of AI in hiring, so automated hiring, um, and then how this can result in discrimination, both by proxy um, and also by platform design. So I believe that actually the design of the platforms can actually enable discrimination. And then I'm also going to touch on the demand for worker data. So what um, automation brings with it is this also increased demand for worker data as more and more big data is folded into um, automated decision making. Um, and this includes biometric data, but also health data that's being collected from workers. So in regards to the first issue, which is the use of AI in hiring, um, I, I just wanna you know, touch briefly on the use of um, proxies. So you know, we all think about proxies for like race or proxies for gender, but you know, there might be also other proxies that are not as well known. So think about, for example, the use of a, a criterion like gaps in employment, which is something that quite a few automated hiring systems use. And, and you might think, okay, well, that's, uh, there's a business necessity for this. Of course, the employer has a vested interest in hiring uh, workers who will have a long work history, a consistent work history. But however, gaps in employment can also impact um, women um, particularly who are, who are mothers or women who have taken time out of the workplace to say care for an, uh, an elderly parent. Um, also, uh, gaps in employment can impact the, the formerly incarcerated. 
So currently there is no federal le legislation against discrimination um, of the formerly incarcerated. And this means that many um, returning citizens, you know, formerly incarcerated citizens find themselves locked out of the workplace forever, um, even after they've paid their debt to society. And automated hiring systems have the capacity to exacerbate this discrimination. Um, so, you know, to focus on that, um, I really want us to think about how we are enabling automated hiring in the workplace. Um, currently, it's um, carte blanche in terms of the use of automated hiring. There are no regulations um, for the development of automated hiring systems. And further still, no regulations on how uh, employers may use automated hiring systems. So essentially, nobody's watching the house <laughs> when it comes to automated hiring. Um, so my... Um, Solution. So, you know, I do want to offer some concrete solutions. My solution for this area is really the idea of a certification system for automated hiring. So um, I would liken this to perhaps the certification system that you have for uh, green buildings, you know, the LEED certification. So for, for an automated hiring to be certified as uh, a fair automated hiring system, at which would then enable it to have a mark, the FAHM mark, um, that automated system would have to undergo audits. Um, and these audits are not just a one-time event. Um, they are a certifying event, but then there's a continued audit of the system after a certain number of years to ensure that it is still continuing to work as, in, as intended. You know, my colleague had noted about unintended consequences that can arise you know, even when you just tweak a little bit of the algorithm or change the data. Um, so in, in really thinking about this certification system, um, we want to think about how we're going to create this. Um, is it at the state level? Is it at the federal level? I personally would love to see it at the federal level, but we know about the gridlocks in uh, getting that to happen, that the state of California could be a pioneer in creating one uh, particularly for for use by governmental systems. Mm -hmm. And then that can then be a trickle down sort of uh, certification system that private employers might also want to have uh, when choosing automated hiring systems. So that's one concrete solution um, that we can really think about. Um, we also want to think about, um, as my colleague has mentioned, uh, enabling litigation, right? Um, for when there has been discrimination by automated hiring systems. Um, th that, this is a trickier problem because, um, you know, automated hiring systems um, operate as black boxes. So it's very hard for a plaintiff to even know when they have been the victim of discrimination. Um, but sometimes uh, plaintiffs can point to, you know, one particular practice that they have experienced or witnessed. And even when they do that, um, they still have difficulty bringing suit under a disparate impact cause of action because of the statistical proof required for that type of cause of action. So in my paper, The Paradox of Automation as Anti-Bias Intervention, I actually propose a, a discrimination per se doctrine that would be a third cause of action under Title VII. Um, and this discrimination per se doctrine would basically allow a plaintiff to point to a specific practice they have encountered or they have noticed that they think has the potential to have a disparate impact. And then the burden would be shifted to the, play, uh, to the employer, uh, the defendant in this case, to then show that that practice does not have a disparate impact. So it's just a, a little sort of reframing um, of the, the burdens really when it comes to proving of disparate impact. So something for, for you know, California to think about. And, and then um, another thing I wanted to also touch on is um, the growing demand for, for worker data, right? So apart from automation and hiring, we also now see a growing demand for worker data, um, particularly in terms of biometric data and health data. And um, I want to stress that there are potential issues of both discrimination and privacy concerns attached to this growing demand. So for example, when you are um, collecting 
uh, worker data in the context of workplace wellness programs, um, you're really asking for a lot of health data. And this health data implicates not just the worker, but can also implicate the worker's family members because of how workplace wellness programs are set up. Um, and so the question is, um, who should have access to this data? Who should have ownership and control of this data? Should um, the workplace wellness vendors be able to sell this data, which is something that they currently do um, and, and do so legally and without um, the consent or even the knowledge of the worker? Um, so in, in my paper, Limitless Worker Surveillance, uh, my co-authors and I, we think about different frameworks that could be adopted to protect worker data. So the first is kind of like a GDPR type framework. So that's a general, uh, you know, worker data protection that would really apply to any everyone. Um, but, you know, there are definitely some issues with GDPR in terms of enforcement. Um, and there could also be general some issues in terms of um, uh, the different employment uh, situation that we have in the United States compared to uh, Europe. Um, another framework would be uh, 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 basically uh, a work uh, sector specific data protection. So the idea is that you wouldn't necessarily have a general data protection, but that you would have uh, sector specific data protection. So you would think about the nature of the job and then come up with data protection specific to each work sector. And then finally, um, a different framework is um, a data specific or data sensitivity specific framework. So this, uh, this uh, third framework would really focus on health data because we believe that health data represents the most sensitive data for workers because then obviously because of you know the way we uh, obtain insurance in this uh, in this country this could impact the access to insurance life insurance disability insurance long term care insurance if some of your work data um, is released and just to really touch upon the pressing aspect of this um, uh, this issue of health data collection of workers there's a current law that has been uh, a bill, I should say, that has been introduced in Congress, and this is HR 1313. It's a GOP-sponsored bill, and what this bill aims to do is to uh, get around um, some of the prohibitions in the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. So the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act was actually passed by uh, President George Bush um, in 2009. Uh, he signed it into law to protect workers from genetic discrimination in the workplace. And the bill, uh, the law basically says that you cannot be discriminated against in the workplace on the basis of your genetic profile. So if you have a heightened genetic propensity for disease, and also you can also not be discriminated against for health insurance um, on the same basis. Um, however, this newly introduced bill, which is HR 1313, would allow employers to um, demand genetic testing as part of workplace wellness programs. So then they could collect um, genetic data in the workplace. Uh, yeah, so many people don't know about this bill. It's, it's you know, just kind of sitting idly in the, in the house, um, but it is an introduced bill. It does show you what is coming in the future or what could result in the future. Um, so that, with that in mind, you know, having legal frameworks for both the collection and the use of worker data, particularly uh, worker health data, uh, remains a pressing uh, issue and I, I think um, an urgent issue to be addressed. So finally, so my, I, I did also want to address one uh, other area, which is uh, the collection of biometric data. Um, so when, what I mean by that is the biometric data that is collected as part of um, the workplace, including in hiring. So for example, HireVue is a company that offers automated interviewing of candidates. And in this automated interviewing, the, ca the candidate is on camera and the camera is basically collecting um, facial expressions 
it's collecting body language, uh, it's, co it's uh, collecting body movement, and this is fed through an algorithm that basically um, provides uh, conclusions of the emotional state of the, the interviewee, you know, the would-be uh, employee. So it can, according to higher view, the claim is that this algorithm can predict things like trustworthiness, uh, honesty, um, the, if the worker will be fastidious or not. Um, so, you know, this is a new technology that is being used uh, frequently now in the hiring process. And the issue, of course, is that this technology is collecting biometric data, is collecting, um, uh, you know, very sensitive information on applicants. And then also you have RFID skin tags, which is becoming a trend in the workplace. This is where um, radio frequency ID chips may be inserted um, under the skin of employees to enable them to access uh, sensitive areas in a workplace, um, you know, uh, access um, computer programs, et cetera. And the problem, of course, is that this is quite a uh, bodily invasion of employee privacy and also can reveal other things about the employee because, of course, it's basically a permanent tag of where the employee is at all times. Um, and, you know, there's no really uh, real regulation as to who will have this data um, beyond the employer or who or whom this data can be sold to or what it can be used for in the future. So I just really wanted to touch upon that as a potential issue. Um, and this issue can also come up really in workplace um, when you think about um, workers' compensation, which I know is a, a big issue in California. So, you know, the idea is that these wearable tech, you know, whether it's RFID skin tags or even just Fitbits or other wearable tech, tech like um, exoskeletons to help uh, the workers lift heavy things or um, helmets that help workers um, see better. Um, the question is all the data being collected as part of these wearable tech, how will they be used for worker compensation cases, right? Um, who will have access to the data to make sure that it's accurate in terms of the employer being able to use it to show worker negligence or worker um, uh, complicity in terms of injury in the workplace? Um, so there, there are huge legal questions about both the collection, but also the use of employee or worker data in the workplace. So with that, you know, I want to thank you for your kind attention, and I look forward to your questions. So I see the reactions from commissioners and want to open it up. And I'm just going to lead us into the discussion by, um, by, by posing one last question uh, to both of you, um, which is I, I've, um, Ifoma has, I think, uh, really put a point on this issue. She said before about, the, about um, you know, AI interviewing, we have not yet deployed self-driving cars on every single um, street and highway because of concerns of safety, among other things. And so why are we so quick to allow these kinds of other technologies like AI interviewing to be done without those same evaluations? And what you've warned about or warned against is, is this idea of techno-fatalism. So since we are California and much of the technology is begun, uh, tested, developed, invested in and deployed here, um, what is it that, that, um, that we can be doing? And I'm actually gonna put this out there and then let some of the commissioners also um, bring in their questions and then ask you to answer. But what is it that we can do in California? And um, specifically, how can technology be used for good? What's the path for that? And then for some of the solutions that you've talked about, how could that help to lead us down that path? Um, and if I want to make sure that you you talked about GDPR, but not everyone is going to be familiar with that concept. And you said what it was, but it'd be really nice to hear a little bit more about that. So let me first go to um, Carla uh, and Governor Granholm and to John and then come back to the panel. Thank you. <laughs> that was an alarming presentation. Uh, just a basic question for each of you, and you answered it to some extent. If we wanted to assert certain principles around this for California, can you just elucidate three or four you'd, you'd emphasize? So um, part of this repeats what I had said earlier, but I think transparency is incredibly important. One of the problems now is workers have no idea what information is being collected True. about them. 
and how it's being used. So transparency um, is a first step. Um, the second thing, um, and relates to a lot of the technologies that if you was talking about, um, and this is always a problem of sort of a puzzle in the employment relationship, which is that whenever you talk about privacy, it always comes back to consent. The GDPR is basically a consent-based model as well, right? The California CPA is essentially a, a consent-based model. So at some point, if there is a, a consensus that there are certain things that just ought to be off limits, like maybe some of this biometric or medical stuff, there may have to be a mandatory rule that cannot be um, contracted around between employers and employees. So I think those are sort of two basic things um, that ought to be, well, and I guess the third is, which is what I'd also said is, getting worker voices at the table. Because some of these technologies can actually be really helpful for you workers, keep the workers safer, um, help them perform better if the data is in the hands of the workers, but not so much if it's being used by the employer as a tool of control. So it's really important to have the worker voice at the table. Yeah, um, thank you very much for that question. Um, for me, you know, I definitely would strongly <laughs> echo um, all that Professor Kim has just laid out, but I would also add that in terms of principles, um, a big one I think that needs to be reiterated is the really the American ideal of equal opportunity. So the fact that we cannot allow AI to be used really as an exclusionary tool, um, because I, I certainly agree that AI can be used as a tool for good, but um, le a regulation is needed to really ensure that that's what happens. Um, and that starts with this principle of that we have equal opportunity for employment for all. And that really means addressing some of the exclusionary ways that AI is used. And then another final point is the idea of human dignity. I think that's something that, that I feel that the EU has a much bigger emphasis on than, this, than sometimes in the US. And I think we really ought to take a look at that um, when it comes to you know, collection of data. Um, because that would really force us to really grapple with this idea that workers do have a say or should have a say in how their data is used because of human dignitary concerns, um, privacy concerns. So. Oh, okay, so I have been asked to um, untangle some of the, um, the <laughs> acronyms oh. that we've been using uh, for those of you who might not be familiar. So general GDPR is a general data protection regulation that the EU passed a few years ago, um, which is um, it tend, it, the focus is on protecting uh, primarily consumer data. And then the Cal CPA is the California Consumer Protection Act, which was passed, I think, two years ago, became effective at the first of this year, um, which is somewhat patterned on the, on the GDPR, although it's a little bit more limited, I think, um, in scope. But those, both of those regulations really started from the perspective of regulating um, consumer privacy, pri providing um, more protections for consumer privacy. Um, they do tend to have more of a, a sort of a consent-based focus. So you, you might have noticed now every time you go on the website, it says um, we're going to use cookies. If you're going to look at anything, you're consenting. Well, so if you look at the website, you're consenting. So a lot of this has happened because of GDPR. Uh, these websites have added these um, these um, uh, sort of informational things, which is technically getting your consent, although, of course, we all feel like, what choice do we have, right? right? Um, and, and that's at, 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 at bottom um, what the issues are. Yeah. So I'm going to experiment with something because we have such rich conversations at the beginning of the day, and we don't want to compromise the rich conversations at the end of the day. So um, I'm going to go have all the commissioners who have their cards up. I'm going to say who you are and then keep you, um, make sure that you can make your comment and then come back to the panel. I'll try to keep track of what's being said so that we can address them all, if that's okay. So I'm going to go to Governor Granholm and then to John, then to Controller Yi, then to Assemblyman Kalra, then to Roy, Doug, and Tom. Okay. Great. My, my question was similar to Carla, but then I've, I've got a couple of nits that I wanted uh, Ifoma to address, if, I, if you could. Number one, um, a lot of uh, companies adopted the automated hiring process in order to root out the biases, right? And so the unintended consequences that have, um, that have resulted are what you're addressing. Is there a private sector entity right now 
that has that actually uh, has figured it out that could be referred to. That's number one. And number two, I think I got the bill number wrong, 1313. Is that right? Yeah, in the House everyone. House Resolution 13? Because yeah. that's Peter King. It's a transit bill. Is it is it tucked in there? Or who's sponsoring that bill, I guess? And what's it called? Um, it's a congresswoman from Virginia, HR 1313. And it's it's something like protection of... Um, I, I can send you the specifics. Yeah, I, I'd offline. be super yeah. interested because I think it, that requires action. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. definitely send you the specifics. Okay. And I'll Perfect. To you as well. Um, so in, in addressing... Oh, wait. Yeah, oh, wait, wait. Let's try. Okay, so John... Just okay, just uh, quickly, I really appreciate this panel. It's really, really excellent. And um, one of the things I think is most important about it is that you're starting from the assumption that there is a fundamental power relationship in the workplace. And these technologies may not be able to replace workers, but they fundamentally expand that power imbalance. Right. It's absolutely critical. Quickly, I really appreciate the, the, the note about transparency and that transparency isn't enough in itself workers and their organizations need the capacity to understand and analyze this data critically and really audit it. What suggestions or ideas beyond like unions forming our own uh, capacity in-house? How can we address that capacity need? Thank you, John. Thank you for the presentation. Um, disturbing and yet um, I think we um, have a lot of ideas about how we may be able to tackle this. Along the line of John's uh, question, it really, I'm focused on kind of bandwidth and expertise. Uh, so the responses to this, um, I mean, I don't have any confidence that certainly government is in a role to kind of regulate um, and that we have necessarily the right expertise to know uh, what crosses the line. So um, just kind of a comment about um, as we look at regulatory response, um, do we still have to rely on industry for much of that expertise? And I would say that gets down to also the worker level in terms of understanding uh, the impact of these technologies and, and data uh, on the workers. And then uh, for the employee, or the worker organizations as well, I just think there's like a, the, what's missing is um, just kind of a basic fundamental level of knowledge about how all this works and the potential impacts. Uh, thank you. Uh, for the presentation and um, the the resolution that was referred to um, by uh, Professor Kim uh, that uh, I think that was put forth this past year, it was, it was actually, um, certainly I had a lot of hesitance with it, uh, partially because of what was refer what you referred to, creating a safe harbor or creating a potential solution without really fully vetting um, the capacity uh, for, for using AI and what have you. And so we'll definitely be watching that very closely uh, based upon some of the uh, comments you made and your expertise. And may reach out to you <laughs> uh, over the next year or so. Um, and, and to, you know, John actually hit my point on the issue of transparency without empowerment of the workers, the transparency, especially if someone has a job and okay, well now they have, it's transparent, but you know, they, they know what is being used from them or taken from them, but what, how are they empowered to understand what that means and then respond to it? And then to, um, uh, to uh, Dr. Ajuma, Ajunwa, the uh, issue of the data, um, whether it's being used to be sold to someone else or being used in nefarious purposes in terms of surveillance or, or, or keeping tabs or a workers' comp, what have you. And the reality is that when you're extracting that kind of information, it is some, it's something of value that's not being compensated for. And so that's the other aspect of it is that you're essentially putting an employee in a position where if they want to have a job, they have to give up this thing of value that's not necessarily part of their contract. But it's just, and so that's where a very scary path to go down in that sense. It's not just similar to things that have been happening for really hundreds of years. It's just now there's new technology that's doing that same kind of surveillance and tracking. Um, one question I had regarding the, of uh, the uh, fair automated hi automated hiring mark uh, is uh, you mentioned an audit and just what you would want that audit to show and especially if it's done on a year over year basis to really try to root out the biases that even come through uh, the use of AI. Thank you, Roy. <clears throat> so as um, as the technology investor on the commission, and I think just given who's here today, might be 
the only person employed in the technology industry who's here. Let me just say, I share all of your concerns and I think they're well articulated. I think as often happens with technologies, it's often the things that we don't know to worry about that end up being the ones that bite us. And we often have hysteria about, you know, I remember the Fiorello LaGuardia ranting against the dangers of the pinball machine. Um, <laughs> and we just want to be careful to, I think we want to do things that stand the test of time here. <clears throat> I'd be curious to hear, in addition to the government responses and some of the um, private organizing, like the lead example, which I think is a terrific one, but might work and might not, whether you believe there are actions that the business world is taking that are um, worth re-examining at the earliest stages of these companies. Um, and then I just want to make one comment, which is, uh, uh, Professor Kim, I think your your point that innocuous, quote unquote, innocuous data when aggregated and collected can become sensitive. It's worth also adding the word valuable to it mm -hmm. and that understanding in this transparency that some forms of data when collected have value and that transparency to the worker, not just about what is being collected, but about what's useful in it and isn't seems, um, seems, really, uh, seems really valid. So just thought I'd mention that, but open to any input and advice. Doug. Thank you. And I really want to thank Professor Kim for uh, making the point that if you involve workers in trying to answer the question, what problem are we using technology to solve for? You might get a very different answer. Right. And uh, you all know me well enough to know I, I like to try to use some real world examples. So I want to tell a story and then ask a question. And I want to point to the UPS driver in the picture behind our panelists and our labor secretary, who's a teamster, who drives a truck with his route is mapped out by software. Uh, his point on that route is determined by GPS. Um, there are automated speed controls on the truck, which is to the benefit of the driver and everybody else, pedestrians and other cars on the road. Inward, outward facing dash cams. That's just part of the technology that Teamsters live with. Um, in the hands of our members, some of that technology actually helps them do their job more productively. And as I mentioned, it leads to safer roads, less collisions. Um, in the hands of our employer, who we mostly get along with, uh, or our other employers, that technology can also be used to surveil and discipline workers. Now the advantage for a UPS driver is that we have language in our collective bargaining agreement that says technology cannot be the sole basis of discipline. All it can do is let the company investigate something further based on data accrued. So my question to you is, back to your point about workers being at the table to ask these questions, Short of having a collective bargaining agreement, like a UPS driver, because for a non-union worker, you get disciplined, you get terminated, you have no protection whatsoever. What are other things we can be doing to give workers a voice? Thank you, Doug. I'm gonna go to Tom. Yeah, um, with respect to some of the benefits of, of these technologies, so, uh, there, we had uh, the Obama administration uh, had an initiative to uh, encourage companies to hire the long-term unemployed because there was a, a, a lot of evidence that employers were discriminating people who had these gaps in their resume. Uh, one thing that we found out was that uh, some firms who were using these tools were actually hiring more uh, long-term unemployed people than the companies who had some specific CSR initiative to do it. So I do think that, the, so that one question is compared to what? Um, so I, I do think that there are instances in which 
the use of these tools may uh, reduce the level of, of discrimination here, here. that is involved when uh, people make decisions. Um, there's a great op-ed from uh, Sendel Mullenathan, who's a professor at the University of Chicago, who, who has said it may be easier to address biases in algorithms uh, than uh, it is to change the hearts and minds of, of people. So I, I think that's just something important for us to, to keep in mind. Um, and with respect to the question about where is the expertise going to come from, from the governance of these technologies, there is now an active research community of people who are involved in the field of machine learning um, that are working, have created this subfield called fairness, accountability, and transparency. Uh, so they're now, uh, if, if there can be a consensus about uh, what is fairness, because if you're a computer scientist, you want to have a more quantitative and rigorous definition of that is, as opposed to, I'll, I'll know it when I see it. Uh, they are designing these algorithms and they're developing sort of auditing mechanisms to figure out how you would uh, evaluate the, the, the quote unquote fairness of algorithmic decision making. Thank you, Tom. I'm just gonna take three more questions, uh, comments, and then um, go back to the panel and close. Uh, so we have James, Mariana, and Soraya. Th thank you, and thank you to the presenters for highlighting many of the things to worry about and, and doing an amazing job on that. I guess in the spirit of uh, thinking about opportunity, um, since that's my theme today, I guess uh, two, three things. One, I wonder if you have a view on how we can actually harness data uh, to improve our labor market's work. I mean, Tom alluded to some of this, but if you speak to labor market economists, one of the things that's actually quite hard to do is to get good data on the labor markets uh, because they mostly rely on surveys, which only a few people fill in. But you, So there's a potential here to improve labor market fluidity, tap into pools of people who typically don't get touched by surveys. So I'm just wondering how you think about harnessing data to actually improve the functioning of labor markets. It's a bit like what's happened in the consumer world. One of the wonderful things about technology and the internet is made all kinds of things like pricing and other things incredibly transparent in a way that's shifted surplus actually to consumers. Is there an equivalent here to actually shift, counter to the power argument, to actually shift power to the workers by creating even greater transparency uh, into the labor market? So that's one question. A second related comment is, I'm glad you made the point about the emergence of new intermediaries. And I also wonder about new aggregators particularly if we look to the future. Curious if you have any thoughts on that. And then finally, one topic that perhaps hasn't come up, again, with the future in mind. One of the things that technology is doing, and I know Mary Gray was here, will probably speak to this later in her part of the presentation, are the creation of new data value chains, where workers now participate in things that are essentially data value chains, whether it's around labeling things for AI, machine learning, but there are all these other new data value chains where workers participate. How do we want to think about what might be coming in that direction? Thank you for the presentation. I'll be quick. Um, one is um, just in addition to transparency and building off of um, Roy's point in terms of data being an asset, are there any models, uh, regulations around workers owning their own data and what that, that, that could look like? Um, in addition to knowing, oh, my employer is collecting all of this, how do I actually um, have some level of ownership and access these data as a sort of big asset? Um, and then the, the second is um, building off of James's uh, point around, in addition to regulation transparency, any um, data disclosure, like, to the government and thinking about government's role, um, especially when we think about intermediaries and marketplaces, um, being able to have more information on the labor markets, but also um, in disaggregated industries like domestic work, where we don't know which home is a workplace, um, which family is an employer. It could actually facilitate education to employers on labor rights and protections, et cetera. So just thinking about data disclosure as part of the kind of regulatory framework. 
Thank you. And then the last one is uh, Dr. Cole. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I uh, was thinking about the sophistication of bias and how as a society we continue to evolve in our sophistication of, of uh, not having an, an equal uh, playing field. But um, I want to get back to you, one of the recommendations you made in terms of diversifying the, the tech industry, and I want to just quickly put into context uh, uh, experience. Um, I'm at a, in higher education, um, our largest, uh, it's a polytechnic university, our largest major is engineering. And we're, we have a major initiative about trying to diversify the STEM fields. Um, and uh, what we're presented with, and as I've heard from some employers, that they are now outsourcing the review of candidates of applicants um, and that they look for specific words on the resumes of students. And so again, it's access to information even to enter in order to demonstrate your skills and capabilities. And so while we might have that lead certified company, if in fact we're going to intermediaries and other entities that wouldn't necessarily, where the accountability ends up being shifted away from the corporations or from the ultimate employers, how do we manage that, uh, that intermediary uh, step that's taking responsibility? As one agency said, they look at 35,000 resumes and they look for specific words. So I need to go out and make sure I know every student, you better have these words on your resume. So if you can um, unfold that, would appreciate it. Okay, so fortunately we have professors sitting before us. So they're used to answering a whole bunch of questions um, about a number of issues after a presentation. Uh, I did want to try to organize a little bit of what we heard and then suggest that you may not be able to answer all of them, but please take the ones that are uh, squarely in your areas of expertise and then the rest, there are many comments and ideas, but this gives us all a better sense, including the panelists, of where the commissioner's interests are and anything you want to say about that, we're going to uh, we're gonna try to wrap that up. So I think the first category was a question about business and private sector, a specific question about whether there is a private um, company, a uh, private entity that has figured this out and then more broadly, what actions can we ask of the business world, especially at the uh, at the entry stage, at the, at the um, development stage of, of those businesses to address some of the risks and the dangers that you uh, talked about. The second category of questions was really around capacity. How do we build the capacity for workers in the workplace, uh, whether it's about power or their own uh, data ownership um, and uh, and uh, and about you know, demanding transparency. If we know we need it, how do we get workers to be able to do that? Uh, what's the capacity building piece? The third were just a whole bunch of questions about data itself. Um, uh, you know, what should we audit for to to root to, to show that we're rooting out bias? Um, uh, and and kind of um, players within the data world, right? Looking at um, if you could identify for us, are there new aggregators? Are there new data chains? Things like that that we want to be um, thinking about within the data world. Anything um, that you're familiar with in your research and your work. Um, and uh, the fourth was a question. I think this is sort of a um, forward looking. Um, if you could, how do we use data for good? This goes to the question of, you know, if there are benefits to the technology that we're talking about, I think we all believe that there are. What do those look like? How do we guard against the dangers to realize those benefits? Um, and, uh, you know, how could data be used for uh, in, in the labor market world? Um, and, and how, you know, what, what, what would that look like, right? How, how could government and others um, help to do that? So whatever one of those categories you want to take um, and however much detail you want to give, we'd love to hear it. Um, I, I guess I'll start in, in terms of um, the response to your question, um, Commissioner, uh, regarding which business entities are getting it right. And, and I don't know if you're asking about business entities in terms of corporations using AI that are getting it right. Who are developing, okay. Okay, so um, there are some, you know, you know, I, I wanna call them automated um, hiring platform developers 
who um, claim to have gotten it right. So I think the problem right now is that, and perhaps this is me being too much of an academic, but it's, it's really the idea that we don't have verification, right? So there are corporations claiming to have gotten it right and who focus actually on um, checking for bias in their own programs. But the problem is this is all self-checked, right? So there's no like third party that's verifying that they did indeed get it right. Um, so that's that's really the problem. That's why we need the regulation to actually ensure this third party checks. But but certain companies like Pymetrics, for example, their whole business model is that we are checking for bias. Um, uh, in terms of corporations that have gotten it right, um, I think you know, like you mentioned, AI is still a tool. So I think you know we don't really want to just focus exclusively on the idea that it's automation that's causing this problem. So in my paper, The Paradox of Automation as Anti-Bias Intervention, I note that you know the paradox is that a lot of times automated hiring is uh, something that's adopted as a preventative measure, right? It's adopted as a, as a solution to bias. Um, and the thinking is that if you take humans out of the equation and you have an automated system, that will also remove human bias. And as I show in that paper, this is not the case. Um, so the real problem is not necessarily automation, it's the human bias that still gets encoded in automation. So of course, automation can be a tool that's used for good, I think, if there are appropriate regulations to check it. And in terms of what the certification could look like, I think somebody raised that question. Um, my idea is that this is a certification, as uh, Commissioner uh, Tom Callio has mentioned, that could be done by qualified computer scientists who are already, already doing this kind of research. Um, so there's Solon, people like Solon Barakas, um, there's people like Kathy O'Neill. Um, Kathy O'Neill is the author of Weapons of Math Destruction, and she actually does have a consulting business where she does do audits for corporations who care to check their automated hiring systems for bias. Um, of course, this is not public, it's, you know, it's a private endeavor, but my solution it would say that a certifying agency, um, this could then be, be public, right? Each corporation that has subjected its automated hiring could then receive this very publicly visible mark. Um, and you know, there might be some use of safe harbor in that case, right? To say, if a corporation undergoes this certi uh, certification and then is taking steps to correct the bias, then you know they could have at least a, a, a period of time that's a safe harbor to fix that system. Um, so I think that's the bulk of the questions. Uh, well, I, one other question that I did want to address um, is, you know, this idea of harnessing data to tap into pools of people that we would not otherwise um, reach. Um, that's an excellent question, uh, Commissioner Manika. And, and I think that is something that um, some automated hiring platforms like Pymetrics, for example, is very interested in doing. Um, in speaking with them, um, they have actually created programs where when you apply for a job, you don't just apply for one job. So they actually allow you to uh, do these games, right? That's actually assessing your skills um, such that they can then recommend you for other jobs that match your skills that you probably might never have heard of, might never have applied to, but it's really a way to diversify the applicant pool for these other types of positions and for these other types of industries. So I, I really do think that yes, data can be harnessed for good with the proper regulations in place. Um, and another question that I did also want to address um, is uh, this idea of uh, you know, higher education, right? And what, what can students do, right? You know, the students who are applying for jobs now. So I teach at Cornell University and I am very uh, intimately aware of this issue of uh, keywords being something that can exclude students. So to give you a story, one of my students who also happens to be a PhD student in computer science, um, she went to a job fair 
And she met, you know, we wouldn't say the name of the company. She met a company representative that said to her, oh, you should apply to us. And she said, I did twice. Mm -hmm. And you rejected me. And the company representative said, that doesn't seem right. You, you clearly have all the qualifications. You know, please send me your resume again and I'll check why we rejected you. So she sent her resume and this is the reason they rejected her. She has a BA in computer science, as well as is now a PhD student in, in computer science. The automated hiring system was set up to look for people who had a BS in computer science. So really, really innocuous mistake that has huge, huge implications. I mean, yeah, I mean, this could exclude basically all the people who were not able to go to schools that had a BS in computer science, for example. Um, and you can imagine, you know, the population of that would represent. So, you know, the issue of students finding work is a very pressing problem. And, you know, this idea of keywords being something that AI systems are being trained to find um, is a problem. Like, you know, there's been people who have uh, developed hacks where, for example, they, they put uh, keywords in invisible ink in their resumes, um, which because they don't actually have those qualifications, but they put it in so that the computer will still, you know, uh, move the resume on. Um, you know, I don't think that's a long-term solution, right? I think, <laughs> I think the solution really, you know, goes back to this responsibility of employers, right, to continually audit their systems to see are we requiring keywords that, you know, don't make intuitive sense to the people who would be applying to us? Are we requiring keywords that are really serving as proxies for things like race or class or gender and therefore, you know, excluding portions of, of our applicant pool? So, you know, I think the responsibility goes back to the employers in that case. Sure. Um, so that was an incredible set of questions, <laughs> any one of which I think we could sit and talk about mm -hmm. for quite some time. Uh, and I've probably lost a few of them along the way anyway, so I apologize. But let me just uh, give a couple general remarks that I hope will address at least some of them. Um, so, yes, um, technology can be less biased than humans, and it can sometimes be more biased than humans, and that's exactly what creates the problem. So we don't want to set up the wrong set of incentives so that none of this moves forward and we lose the positive um, potential. Um, but I have often heard people say, well, humans are worse. And to me, that's not an answer because even if humans are worse, if we know there's a problem with a piece of technology, why don't we try to fix it, right? Why don't we try to address it? Um, so um, I am by no means a computer scientist, but I um, have been reading some in that fairness, accountability and, and transparency um, literature um, where the computer scientists are trying to find ways to fix the code to deal with these problems. Um, so I think, and I think that's a really positive development. And one of the things that's positive about it is that the computer scientists are actually paying attention, right? And trying to fix it. But there's still two challenges. One is nobody can agree on a definition of fairness. Um, there was the uh, well-known study of um, predictions of future dangerousness, uh, the COMPASS program that was used in Florida and it was shown to overpredict that black defendants would reoffend as compared to white defendants. And this got picked apart by the academics. And when it turned out to be, the company said, well, it's race neutral. It was, uh, it was race neutral in that the error rates were the same across blacks and whites, but the false positive rates and the mm. false negative rates were not the same. And it turns out mathematically, it's, it is, can't, it is, there are situations where it is impossible to equalize across all three of those things, in which case you then have a choice of what do we mean by fairness, which is why even though I think that this computer science community is really important, at some point there has to be a public conversation. Maybe in the criminal justice context, for example, a false positive is just worse, right, than other kinds of errors, and we should have that conversation publicly. Um, the second thing, um, which I think is true in criminal justice, but also certainly true in the employment context, is even if you can fix the algorithm, right, so that we know with confidence that it is not screening out people in a biased way, we should not think that we are done. Because if it's, if it's, allow, if it's uh, creating, um, if it's allowing for hiring 
in a way that appears to be completely, say, race and gender neutral, but in fact is not as good at selecting the best employees in different categories, what that might mean is when they get in the workplace, um, some employees may be more successful than others, or even if it's completely equal, if they get to the workplace and they're subject to sexual harassment or they're not getting access to mentoring, that's not gonna solve the problem either. So I think it's really important that these technical pieces, while it's important that there be attention to them, they're understood as just one small piece in this overall uh, employment cycle that affects uh, fairness and access. Um, um, I should probably, uh, let me, uh, I, I, I realize we're over time here. Um, so, so in terms of one of the advantages of all this happening by data is we actually do have the possibility of learning more about it. And I think getting more data out of the intermediaries would be really, really interesting to do. Uh, Facebook, I could give as an example because Facebook actually is a little bit transparent with its advertisers. Not all platforms are like that. Sometimes you don't even know who it's going to, um, who your ads are going to or who your, uh, your job um, postings are going to. So, so forcing more information, sharing by the intermediaries would help in diagnosing some of these problems. Um, uh, and, and so all of this leads me to think that just sort of a, a liability fix is not likely to be the way to go. I think there needs to be a more robust regulatory framework where, I don't know, somebody mentioned this, that, that the expertise exists on the government side and on the civil society side as well. Transparency, you can get this, and then the expertise, so that people with a different set of interests can begin to look at this data and, and try to um, analyze um, what's going on. Um, I think I'll just mention one other, um, one other um, point, which is just to go back to this idea of, I, I don't know how to solve the problem of how to give workers more power. <laughs> I wish I knew, right? I don't know what to do about the decline, you know, the decline in the unionization rate. Um, and that would be a great one if, if we could just fix. Um, but the, the, I think we can still start to think about ways of getting workers' interests to frame the problem. So one of the things I think that was talked about last night is um, some jobs um, have very high turnover. Right? And you could look at that as a problem with the worker, and I think that many of the hiring systems look at it that way. We have a problem with turnover. Let's figure out the algorithm that will identify the workers who are less, least likely to leave this job. Or you can look at it and say, we have a problem with turnover because there's a problem with this job. Let's figure out what's the problem with the way this job is structured, and maybe technology can help us solve that problem so that we have less of a retention problem for, for uh, keeping employees. And that's an example of if you can get that perspective on the table, maybe the technology can be used to solve the problem of retention for employers and employees, right? But in a way that is helping produce better jobs for workers along the way, rather than just finding the workers who are willing to put up with whatever. Thank you so much. We're gonna move on now. Um, I know we didn't get to all the questions, but the intent is not always to get them done in the panel, right? The intent is to surface them, and I'm sure we'll come back to them in the conversations throughout the rest of this day and the rest of this commission. So thank you both very, very much. Good morning. It's almost afternoon. There's still there's still coffee, so it's kind of morning. Um, so I am delighted to be able to um, moderate this uh, conversation, and I want to stipulate at the outset that this could very easily be a four-hour conversation. Um, you know, when I was looking through the incredible materials that are developed by these two women, it struck me that there are many ways in which the conversation that we are about to have is at the very heart and soul of what we are thinking about in terms of the future of work because it posits the, the current conditions against changing conditions and really does keep an eye on the horizon of what does that then mean 
for where we are going and what we all collectively in civil society can do about it. So I wanna say that because I, I suspect that this will be a very robust conversation. I have been given strict instructions to keep it to 50 minutes. So I'm gonna do my best, which means I'm gonna be quite the activist uh, moderator as we uh, make our way through, through this conversation. Um, one thing I wanna say that I thought was so beautifully done by the last panel was uh, a nice teeing up of the issues, but a real focus on potential solutions. And so I'm gonna ask my, my panelists here to keep that same spirit alive and really keep us uh, focused on the solutions since this is the, the, the meeting where we are really pivoting to uh, thinking about solution sets and what that means given the, the varied problems that we've already identified um, for the future. Um, Let's see, there's a lot of nuance, I wanted to say, in, in the conversations and the arguments that we're gonna hear today. And so it's, I think it'd be very easy for us to, to kind of uh, end up on one end of the continuum or another, but I'm gonna really push us to really try to get to the nuance that's in between them. And because I think that's where we're gonna get the real um, kind of juicy bits around what we need to be thinking about um, from a policy perspective, certainly, but also from the employer and the labor perspective around how do we think about the future future of work. So I wanted to, to offer that as well. Um, I want to just introduce, you all have bios, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing our panelists, but they are um, very renowned. We have with us uh, Sharon Block, who is currently the Executive Director of Labor and Work-Life Program at Harvard Law School, and she uh, has held key labor positions across the legislative and executive branches in the federal government, um, and in particular held a historic White House Summit on Worker Voice. Also with us today is Mary Gray, who's the co-author of Ghost Work and How to Stop Silicon Valley from Building a New Global Underclass um, that was released this past May. And she's an anthropologist and media scholar by training and focuses on how everyday uses of technology can transform people's lives. Um, they are gonna both posit two, two kinds of um, conversations. One's gonna be thinking about how do we really get to restoring what should be a good collaborative between um, uh, workers and em employers and employees around the nature of work. And another which is going to say, well, maybe actually the features that we see in our labor market today around contingent work, around shifting labor market um, arrangements, maybe that's a permanent feature. Maybe we should accept that and think about the solutions to that problem. Or, as I said, maybe there's some tweener that we should be thinking about. Um, and so that is gonna be the nature of, of the conversation today. The final thing I wanna say before I turn it over to Sharon for some introductory comments of about 10 to 12 minutes is to say that um, I suspect there'll be a lot of conversation today. I'm gonna to ask that as we have in our problem statement, a lot of issues have already been identified. And so we're gonna ask that we focus the conversations and the comments today on those things that are additive to how we are thinking about the solutions to the problems that we've already identified. So if things have already been surfaced in conversations either today or in past meetings, hold those, but really we wanna figure out how do we continue to build a framework around what some of those solutions are. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sharon. Thank you so much and thank you for um, inviting me here to be part of your amazing work. I've been following it from the other coast. Uh, so I've been asked to do a few things. One, to talk about what is labor law, what are the problems with labor law, and then what are some of the solutions to those problems. So I'll try to take less than four hours, but um, <laughs> it's a big topic. <laughs> uh, so first I thought I would start with what is labor law. I think it's first important to note that it is not employment law. So employment law is like the right to minimum wage and overtime and protection from discrimination. Labor law is about a process. Uh, it's not about a particular outcome. It's, it's what we call a process right as opposed to a substantive right. And labor law is generally thought of to have four projects. So first, labor law governs the process through which workers decide whether they want to bargain individually or collectively with their employers. And the law's guiding principle is about ensuring that workers have a free choice on that question, not what the outcome of the question is, but that there is a system in which they can, um, can make that decision free from um, interference or undue influence. So in its first project, then labor law is the law of union organizing. Second, labor law governs the relationship between unions once they're formed and employers. 
So the law structures the process by which collective bargaining agreements are reached, tells employers that they must bargain over some subjects, allows employers to refuse to bargain over other subjects. It gives workers the right to strike in order to push for their interests, and it gives employers the right to respond forcefully to strikes. So in its second project, we can say that labor law is the law of collective bargaining and employee-employer relations. Uh, third, labor law polices the relationship between individual workers and their collective union. There are rules around democracy, uh, around accountability and transparency. Uh, so we can say that la labor law is also the law of union democracy. Fourth, the law has another project that until recently um, has always taken a back seat to these other projects. Um, but that is really now much more coming to the fore. And that's the project of protecting workers when they act concertedly, even if they have no interest in forming a union. Um, as you probably seen in the news, this is getting a lot more attention. Think of uh, Red for Ed, Google workers walking out. In Boston, we had Wayfair workers who walked out. Again, no union organizing campaign necessarily going on there, um, but the law still does, labor law protects those kinds of activities. So we can say that labor law is the law of collective action. So these are four very ambitious projects. Um, so next I was asked to talk about sort of how does it work? Uh, so for your purposes, it's probably most important to know just a few things about labor law, how labor law in the US works. So who is covered by this, what we call labor law? In the private sector, uh, we said workers are covered by the National Labor Relations Act. Generally, it covers, <coughs> people sometimes say it covers all workers, it covers the private sector, but there are big groups that are left out. Agricultural workers, domestic workers, and independent contractors are outside the protection of the act, as are state and federal government workers. Federal workers protected by a different federal statute to give them collective bargaining rights. State government workers, it's up to the state. And you may be surprised in California, because obviously these are very robust collective bargaining rights for state government workers here. In many states in this country, state government workers do not have a right to collective bargaining. Again, we saw that in red, if you followed the red for red, the teacher walkouts. Those were, for the most part, teachers who had no right to collective bargaining. That's why they had to go bang on the door of the legislature, because they actually don't have the right to sit at the bargaining table. So for the most part, though, the, we think of the private sector workers as being covered by the National Labor Relations Act. It's administered by an agency called the National Labor Relations Board. They have no private right of action. So this, this little five-member-led agency um, in Washington sort of holds their rights in their hands. Now, right now, there are only three members. They're all Republicans. That gives you a little bit of a sense of what some of the problems are. Uh, with this way that this statute works. not I'm not saying this is not a, necessarily a partisan statement. I was once a member of the National Labor Relations Board when there were only three Democrats. But just this idea that workers really have no control over how their rights are adjudicated under this federal system. Um, they also, the NLRB also runs elections. So they, this project of uh, union organizing, the NLRB runs that process by which employees are supposed to be able to have free choice in deciding whether to be represented by a union or not. I think lastly, for the purposes of your work, it's important to understand the relationship between federal law and state law when we're talking about union organizing. For the most part, uh, union organizing, collective bargaining rights are governed by federal law. The Supreme Court has said that this federal law has what's called broad preemptive effect. It pushes the state out of being able to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, legislate at all these, uh, those four projects that I talked about a minute ago. In fact, it's so broad, the Supreme Court has said, it even pushes out anything that is arguably covered by the NLRA. So you might wonder, so why am I talking to you? But we'll get to that in a minute because there are some areas where the state can act. Okay, what's the problem? Here's what we know. Our current system is broken. The laws that help workers form unions and build the middle class in the 20th century have not kept up with changes in the economy. I think you probably heard a lot about that. 
So the law is no longer a tool that can be used to build power sufficient to countervail the power of corporations in our economy and our democracy. And those two are really linked. If I had more time, I would tell you more about the very specific problems, but just quickly, there's a problem of inclusion. Again, those categories that I said are kept out of the law. They have at their root um, uh, expl an explicit racist deal when the National Labor Relations Act was passed. And so there is this moral failing at the heart of our labor law. There's also a problem in that workers are forced to bargain um, enterprise by enterprise, little workplace by little workplace. Um, this creates incentives for employers to fight to the death to keep unionization out because of at least a perception that it will put them at a competitive disadvantage. In most of the rest of the world, at least some collective bargaining happens at a sectoral level, which essentially takes wages out of competition, allows employers to compete based on the, their productivity, on the quality of their products, but not on how little they can pay their workers. There's also the problem of ossification um, because it can only happen at the federal level, we have um, this lack of innovation and experimentation that we see at the state and local level. Okay, very quickly, what should the law be? Because we're talking about solutions. So at the federal level, what I've been doing at Harvard for the past two years is um, a project to come up with the answer of how we should completely rewrite uh, federal labor law. Uh, it's called the Clean Slate Project. We will be releasing our recommendations um, on Thursday, a week from today. But I wanna focus now on the four things that I think can be done at the state level. And I would argue this is free advice, so take it, take, it's worth what you paid for it. But I think that there are four things that California could do um, that really would enhance the uh, collective, the ability of workers um, in the private sector to uh, build countervailing power. First, the state can, can legislate collective bargaining rights for workers who are not covered by the NLRA. So for domestic workers, agricultural workers, which has already happened here in California, and for independent contractors. There are tricky legal issues to be sure, but again, this is my opinion. I think the Ninth Circuit has given you a pretty good roadmap for how to do it for independent contractors. There are also complicated interactions with AB5, but I do think at least for rideshare drivers where we've had the federal government say they are not employees for the purpose of federal collective bargaining rights, that the state could, even though under state law, uh, they are considered employees that they could let that the state could legislate to give um, those kinds of workers collective bargaining rights where it's clear they don't have those rights at the federal level. And it would be a fascinating experiment. I've written a little bit about this with my partner at, at Harvard Ben Sachs. It would be an opportunity to do sectoral bar to create a real mm -hmm. sectoral bargaining system that would not be encumbered by all the problems that we have with the NLRA. So it, it would be a really important um, undertaking. The state could also enact just cause dismissal standards, as you probably know. In this country, unlike most countries, we have what we call at-will employment, which means you can be fired for a good cause, no cause, bad cause, um, as long as it's not illegal, as long as it's not discriminatory. Um, in most of the rest of the world, and in fact, in Montana, oddly, uh, you can only be you can workers can only be fired if their employer actually can articulate a reason, like connected to their work, for why they're being fired. Uh, this is it doesn't might not sound like it's connected to collective bargaining, but it really is because how broken the federal system is when workers sort of put themselves out on a limb, they take the risk of of organizing. Um, again, we know that there's incredible retaliation for workers who engage in organizing campaigns. There was a study at EPI uh, that came out from Economic Policy Institute recently that said that in 20% of union organizing campaigns, workers are fired for engaging in those campaigns. What happens to them then is they've got to go through this, this I mean, I, I'm a former NLRB member, and I will say a ridiculous process to try to get their jobs back that can take years and years. Um, a just cause dismissal standard is just more protection. It's more saying we've got your back if you're going to risk um, exercising rights and think it's really important 
uh, rights really aren't worth much if workers are afraid to exercise them. So a just cause dismissal standard um, would would do a lot to to give workers the sort of more security if they want to engage in collective bargaining. Um, it's actually the New York City Council is considering, at least in the fast food sector, um, adopting a just cause dismissal standard. And Philadelphia recently adopted just cause for certain sectors of, of um, their workforce. Uh, lastly, the things that, that you could do at the state level is wage boards. California does have a history of this. It hasn't always been um, an easy road, but I think with the right legislation and the right standards, wage boards that maybe could even extend beyond just wages, if they start to extend to too many conditions of employment, you're going to run into this preemption problem. The NLRB is going to say, no, 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 that's that's our domain. But I think there there is a place to be creative, to create a role for worker organizations in that wage board um, process that does then encourage organizing, it encourages building worker power um, that would be... Um, that would be very, could be very impactful. And the last thing where I think the state does have, um, does have some room to move that would also encourage organizing and build worker power um, is to require workers to be on corporate boards. Obviously, again, California is innovating in this area with requiring um, gender diversity on corporate boards, but, uh, but, mandating that workers or their representatives be on corporate boards. Again, it brings a new voice into the decisions that corporations make. Um, I'm not a big fan of this one just on its own. I think it's an important part of a system, um, but it is an interesting idea and it would be great to see a state like California experiment with it. Thank you. You did well. Right. You were within a 30 second window. That's awesome. <laughs> Especially because I'm sitting here passing her notes. So thank you so much. Mm. Mary, you want to take your? Sure. And and there'll be several um, suggestions that are actually in common, very much sync with Dr. Block's recommendations. And I'm hoping what I'm offering you is a framework for why. So, and, and thank you for the invitation to present today. I'm, I, I was born and raised in Central California. So, um, you know, this is the part of the state that's largely been left out of digital economies, economic boom, and I actually feel very passionate about this topic, so I get somewhat emotional about this topic. Um, I'm going to, you know, do my best to, to you know, be as straight-faced as I can. Um, it's okay, so, it's emotional. You can, you know. <laughs> I mean, I feel incredibly strongly about this, and I, we need so much data at the table, so it's that I feel my hair is on fire to make sure you hear what I have to say. Um, so my co-author, uh, computer sci uh, scientist Siddharth Suri and I spent five years studying the lives of people, thousands of workers who were working on platforms. In addition to studying those platforms, engineers, the companies who are creating this work, both in the United States and India. We spent 19 months. I personally did field work with over hundreds of people, stayed in their lives for, you know, for to see the cycle of them going in and out of these worlds. And they're participating in what we argue is a growing world of platform work that most consumers cannot see. This is paid work that's at least in part sourced, scheduled, managed, shipped, and billed through a combination of algorithmic management, application programming interfaces, those are APIs, and the internet. Let's bring it all down, bring the bluster down. This is just software and the internet people. So whenever you hear the word AI, just think software. So software and the internet is effectively creating the disaggregation of work. It is not a niche job. It's not just the Lyft or Uber driver you see. It's literally platform work reflecting the reorganization, arguably the dismantlement of full-time employment itself. So that's the thing we want you to track. What did we learn talking with these people? Artificial intelligence and the pursuit of artificial in intelligence produces two new streams of what we call information service work. The first are tasks that train algorithms to automate human decisions. So these are tasks that include things like data labeling and debugging that are done today by people so that they can train algorithms, software, to organize information to automatically do something down the road for you. Think about your calendar. 
the, you know, the holy grail would be that our calendars could actually automatically read something in our email and land something on our calendars and it would be accurate. That takes a lot of human effort to see how did you come up with the decision about where you put something on your calendar? How are you coordinating with peers? It's actually quite labor information intensive modeling that's going on. So that's one stream of work. But there are also tasks that are routed for moments of snap judgment, like content moderation, which two years ago, if I said content moderation is done by people, no one would have known what I was talking about, and I would have needed four hours to explain that. But it's also text-based customer service support. It's last mile delivery of physical services like home care through telemedicine and texting. This is all work that demands more complex human communication and coordination with other people. It's effectively keeping humans in the loop where AI fails. And it's in some cases pushing AI along, but in many ways it's building out new markets where people are intentionally kept in a computational loop to solve something or fill in for AI when it falls short. We call the shape of this work the paradox of automation's last mile. There is no obvious end in sight when AI is applied to on-demand information service work. Why? Because we've built a world that's reliant on people training AI because we increasingly want it to do things for us as consumers or filling in when it can't re replace the distinctly human capacity to care and serve for each other. That's why we call it information service work. In many ways, it's responding to a request for help. So when con consumers or companies allied or fail to recognize people responding to these platform-driven requests, the request or demand side of this market, on-demand jobs are quickly slipping into what we call ghost work. Ghost work is not describing a specific job, it's describing work conditions. There are work conditions, labor conditions that fail to see or intentionally devalue or hide people's collective contributions to our economy and to our society. Like that's the thing to fight. So the value in these task-based markets and I think this is what's fascinating. We don't have an economic model for this. The value is abundance. It's not redundancy. It's, it's literally about creating a pool of people, finding not just the perfect employee, but often somebody who can deliver something right now. The values in the ability to aggregate many people willing and able to step in immediately where and when AI can't do the job. It's not just one person delivering a moment of insight, and in fact, it's really about being able to have many people making themselves available 24 seven to answer a call for help. For help. I've realized lately, like one way to translate this for anybody who's ever used a ride hailing app, and I know many of you probably have in this room, is that when you open up your, when you open up your phone, what you're really buying is the assurance that you see several different cars that are hovering around who could pick you up in five minutes. As a consumer, you'd be much less interested in that service if it showed you two cars that might show up in 20 minutes. So this is literally a market built on creating a labor and supply side demand and mediating those two. The problem is that right now there's so much power on the demand side, on the folks who are saying, I wanna, I wanna basically, I have this request that needs to be filled. That's who's being served right now. But this open call approach, which is fundamentally what's shaping these markets, this task-based work, task work, means that employment looks much more like a book club with a small group of diehard enthusiasts, and we call them always on, dedicated to sticking around, and they have many different reasons they've chosen to make this an income stream. But there's a core group of what we call regulars who have constraints on their availability, but can use this work to supplement other interests and other income streams. There are people who have picked a couple of days to work, a couple of hours to work, particular projects that interest them. They're this deep bench that step in when folks who are always on step away so that you as a consumer cannot tell the difference, that there's not just a full-time team providing you a service. And then there's this long tail of what we call experimentalists who make up the bulk of who's available. They're people who sign up for an account, do one or two projects before they walk away and never return to do this work again. These people have reasons they walk away. And definitely in many of the cases where we were doing interviews is because they couldn't figure out how to make this economically useful to them. But they also contribute values to these platforms because they 
build out that abundance. So when you're thinking about these three different work types, they're not types of workers. They're effectively ways in which people engage these platforms and people move through the ranks. You have to kind of experiment before you would ever decide to do this all the time as an always on. That's the, the hardest part of, about this reality. They're all equally, if differently, necessary to build out that abundant commons of available workers. This distribution of 10% always on, 30% regular, 70% experiment, experimentalist, create widely different ways to identify or not with the work that people are doing. This is key for people thinking about organizing. They are not one type of worker, but they have three unmet needs in common that they shared with us that should direct our thinking. They needed to control their schedules. This was not like a zeal for flexibility. These are people who have constraints on their time, often caring for young people, caring for elders, other educational interests, other jobs. But importantly, they have to control their schedules so the other kinds of jobs available to them do not meet their needs. The second the need that people were, were voicing was a need or desire to control their projects. And we shouldn't be surprised that we've raised an entire cohort of people on the idea that it, it's about following what you desire doing. That's no less true among the people doing these jobs. They wanna be able to pick what projects interest them, what connects with their interests and their capacities. I think most people in this room can relate to that. And then third, they wanna control their networks. And that's often a reflection of how they've been marginalized in formal employment. But many of them talked about wanting to be able to control who they work with. Again, I bet many people in this room can uh, relate to that. But that means that platform work holds possibilities for addressing needs that are going unmet. This labor market is like no other in that it distributes, that, that the distribution is also a long global supply chain and people who will never share a single work site. There's no factory floor. They typically support many clients. There's no single employer of record and they don't share a professional identity or even the same investment in the work that they're doing but they all are necessary, necessary to meet the consumer and business demand that's created by these platforms. For organizers, that's one of the biggest challenges. Paradoxically, service industry businesses, particularly those serving and managing information, are completely reliant now on workers coming and going rather than recruit, recruiting and retaining a core group of people mostly because they're constantly building out speculative projects to meet uh, consumer demand or chase what consumers might want. So a core group can't meet the constant demands and dynamics of consumer needs and demands through a mix of AI, uh, uh, through the traditional forms of employment that we've had. It's relying on this mix of artificial intelligence and collective human intelligence and expertise. So our old approaches and economic models for employment and laws, as as Dr. Block noted, to stabilize um, work for business and, and workers no longer address the need for sustained commons of independent workers serving many clients with constant changes in consumer demand that we're, that we're um, researching in this environment. So what are some practical steps? The conclusion of our book has 10 specific concrete recommendations for what consumers, the public and private enterprise can do but I wanna focus on four recommendations as places to start. And these reflect opportunities to build on what workers told us they would need. This is not coming from our abstraction or projection of what people should want. It's what did they tell us they need. Recognize independent workers' rights to organize as associations. We need a new mode and model of guild so that they can legally lob lobby for their shared interest. A significant finding from our research is that workers, particularly those always on, already form online and offline networks. They text each other, they hang out in chats together, they already organize. This is no surprise to organizations like National Domestic Workers Alliance. They've led the way in demonstrating the capacity to facilitate independent workers' collective action. What these workers need are more resources to support those efforts. I've shared a new report by the Digital Future Society, um, a group that I work with in Barcelona, with an outline of what this could look like. But the key element is that it would equip workers' collectives to serve as third parties that could be 
for example, the keepers of workers' credentials and their identities, as well as their work reputations. They could hold data that's collected about their activities and share it with businesses that want to broker that data without violating workers' rights to the, their privacy. So there's a new role for organizations, traditional labor associations that could serve a business need and workers' needs. A second recommendation to chambers of commerce. These workers are your new small business on Main Street. Government could help chambers build municipal broadband so that independent contractors organized as cooperatives have reliable and equal access to the internet, healthy ergonomic workstations, and I could go on about how what a public health nightmare is waiting for us, looking at people's home office setups doing this work, but this would give them a chance to have peer co-working space. You could move funds into public libraries to properly equip them for what they're already doing, which is serving as de facto co-working spaces today. Third, you could have a, a good work code for the AI labor supply chain. This is a project that I'm working on with colleagues. Effectively, this industry of, of labor market brokers need a, a high road. So they want to set a standard. The good actors in this space are already doing what they can to make workers the center of their value proposition. But the state could incent sticking to a work uh, to a standard so that work conditions are clear, so that bad actors are, are called out, so that they can then develop AI and consumers would have a very clear sense of who has been working with their information, who's had a hand in creating what they're reading, what they're consuming. That would be good for the general public as well. Fourth, the time's come to make sure that every working age adult has access to basic benefits, no matter where they work or how many minutes they're on the job. Every company that extracts value from a worker's contribution should be underwriting a bundle of portable benefits that includes health care, paid leave, retirement, and continuing education. Because if you're working around tasks and projects, there's no moment at which you're between jobs, you're between tasks and projects. And employment stops meaning anything. So the goal would be what are the bundle of sources of support that will effectively make this pool, this commons, available for the next day. So that employers, not just one, but many, are able to draw on a healthy pool of workers. So businesses, particularly startups, but also incumbents that rely on the supply chain of vendors and these labor pools would benefit from a public, from a healthy, prepared, independent contract workforce. Benefits should be agnostic to worker classification because they're effectively a public and private good. So because people are doing ghost work, um, they might effectively show up in a survey that counts them as doing temporary staffing or alternative work ar arrangements or self-employed. We don't have a good head count on how many people are doing this kind of work. So to James's earlier comment, we need basic data. We don't have the measurements yet. Economics doesn't have the tools for being able to measure how many people are participating. But by our, estimate, by our estimates, we already have roughly 20 million people in the United States who have earned some income from this kind of work. The current state of their poor work conditions is not about a market failure. This is a social failure. We are not attending to our need to treat these workers with respect and dignity. And we know historically the only thing that's ever brought good work conditions is advocating for workers' rights to them. It's not waiting for the market to figure it out. So perhaps with that, I'll, I'll uh, cede the floor so we can have a conversation. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'd love to just start by asking each of you to respond and then we're gonna go to the commissioners because I've already got a list of questions. Um, you each kind of posited two kind of distinct visions around the future of work. And I'm wondering if you think they can coexist. And if maybe Sharon, you want to start with by speaking to that. Sure, absolutely. I mean, as I sort of started with the the right to collective bargaining, I mean the is is a process right. It it is the channel through which um, workers and and note on vocabulary, like I use the word workers intentionally because it's not about employees, it's not about independent contractors. I mean, we really need to think now about workers, whatever their classification, being able to have a voice and some agency in, in their economic lives and the lives of the companies to which they add 
value. Um, and so I think it, it is an incredibly adaptable process, um, especially with technology now, you know, the way that, not the way that the statute works today, but I think through technology, the idea of being able to link workers who share a common employer or platform who, who don't never are in the same place at the same time is actually possible. And to coordinate, you know, something that approximate what we think of traditionally as collective bargaining is actually, um, you know, real in a way that that maybe never has before been before. Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways, I, I, my preference would be to just focus on worker as a as a category. And when I'm drawing out independent contractor, it's really to note that right now we do have this classification system that really doesn't meet many people's needs that we know has not been updated to meet the reality of a world in which everything isn't happening on one site with one employer. But I would say they're quite complementary in that we can imagine there will always be a need for firms to establish a core set of employees full time. The argument we're making is that increasingly where do we see economic activity, certainly globally, but here as well, it's moving towards service healthcare, other forms of care work, other kinds of information service work. That's not inherently a bad job. It's that we don't know how to value it. So what would it look like to be thinking about valuing work that literally flows and ebbs with consumer demand that does recognize there will certainly be some full-time employees, but when you're not manufacturing a, a chair or a hard durable product, you have a different orientation and needs for, for workers in that setting. Great, thank you. So here's how I'm gonna handle this. I'm gonna um, group uh, comments in groups of three. So we'll take three questions and then I'll let you respond and then we'll take another three questions and that way we'll kind of chunk them out a little bit. So let's start with Governor Granholm. Great, Mary, um, super interesting. I know that um, you talked about collective bargaining and potentially unions being the holders of data. Wondering if you can comment, and maybe your book describes data as labor, mm -hmm. and how, I know Jerome Linier from, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his right, from Microsoft is also doing some work on this, but no state has done this, no city has done this. California is so forward looking and be super interesting at least to explore. Should um, unions be the intermediary that might hold the data for labor? payments as well? Is there another mechanism? And do you talk about that in your book? Okay. Let's go to Mary Kay Henry. I just wanted to thank you, Londe, for the frame about we have uh, four months of thinking about problems that were in the statement. And can we use these two experts on uh, things that we haven't tackled before? And so it's in that spirit. I really am grateful, Sharon and Mary, for how concrete the specific things you're saying that direct us. But I want to challenge your imagination and say, Sharon, if you had a magic wand and we're going to tell the commission, here's the most catalytic thing you could do that would unite my five ideas, mm. this is what it would be. And then, Mary, I want to go to your heart and say, how do you take those unmet needs of the workers you described and the recommendations and change uh, the level of inequality in the valley? And how would you um, lever what you started by saying is? Great, and then Roy. Thank you both. Terrific to hear you know, the frame of your ideas applied to our context. <clears throat> I have a question which m might be too big so you can feel free to dismiss it or qualify it, but so much of what you're describing is uh, especially Mary in ghost work is companies that are in California with and people all over the country and the world and you know maybe this builds on Mary Kay's question about um, about what would unite and lever I wonder how you if you were sitting in our shoes would think about our obligation to people outside of those who are working here in California and the role that we can play because I think we'd like to play a role in setting templates more broadly and then the second thing I want to say is just more of a comment. Uh, it strikes me that one of the practical obstacles beyond the law uh, 
to organizing across sectors or in the case of ghost work or distributed workforces of different kinds is just the ability to communicate with your fellow workers and the workplace mentality included that because you just could put up a poster or talk to people face to face and i wonder maybe that this is more of a comment than a question but i'm thinking a lot about the role that we may be able to play in setting standards that enable people to just be in touch with one another with the idea that yeah. from that much other action could follow great mm -hmm. you guys like to respond yeah so on the question of Dana's labor it's, uh, I, I'm one of my colleagues, uh, or a couple of my colleagues, um, and I have quite a number of debates around this, is that in many ways, um, recognizing that workers have different vested interests in when their, um, when their work processes are monitored and captured so let me make it concrete. If you have a group, a team that are, that are effectively building out a project of some kind and being able to watch their decision-making process, the, the reasonable inferences from, from what they're doing could actually um, then build a system that replaces them, they may not be that interested in having their workflows monitored, surveilled, and captured, but they might be willing if it was negotiated to consider that IP, to consider that their intellectual property. I think what's fascinating is that it's not really one person's intellectual property, it's the team's intellectual property. So it's a really interesting, um, and I think a doable problem to work through the complexity of how would you share, what's the shared equity in that? Like how would you, how would you um, distribute the value? Uh, but we do talk about that a bit in the book, and probably to me the more important piece of it is to say who's going to be in the best position to navigate and negotiate that and to have labor power at the table when otherwise it's a company just capturing that data flow. There should be you know, a clear, transparent rule about who has a right to access that data, and it shouldn't be a given that just because I can get to it, I can have it. So what we argue in the book is that the role that unions could be playing, that associations can be playing, is that they effectively can represent members who then can share that productivity with their, you know, with their membership base, with, with their collective, and then they can ask how they want it negotiated. Think of it as kind of the, the, um, the meeting of a data trust of some kind where everybody's agreed, like, yes, I'm gonna put in my data. I don't know if it's gonna be worth something, but maybe it will. And that you have somebody negotiating those rights and controlling that. So there's a lot of opportunity there. I'll take a stab at Mary Kay's question. You know, I think it's obviously hard because of this, um, the control that federal labor law has over what states can do. But I really do, you know, again, this is my opinion, but I really do think coming up with a sectoral collective bargaining process um, for workers who are outside, I mean, you know, in, if I could, if I was really queen of the universe, I would do this at the federal level, obviously, but, but leaving that aside, coming up with a sectoral collective bargaining process for workers who are outside of the NLR, outside the NLRA, um, would just, would really be game changing. I mean, again, I just have to be an optimist or I can't get out of bed in the morning. Like <laughs> hopefully one day we will be able to change federal labor law. And so having an experiment um, with what that could, what sectoral bargaining could really look like in this country um, would be so helpful when that moment comes, when you can scale it up. Um, and then I think some of these other things you could do through that process. I mean, you could negotiate workers on, cor on a corporate board. So again, the idea that collective bargaining is this process, right, that you can take where the parties think it should go makes it so powerful as opposed to saying, do this one thing. Everybody do it, but do the one thing. If you if you do collective bargaining and you do it at the sectoral level, you, you can, that is a, a, an avenue to making real change. Um, I don't know if that answers Roy's question at all in terms of what we should be thinking Our about. Our obligation to others. Obligation to others. How would you think about it if you were us? 
I mean, I think the obligation to others within this country is again, sort of what I was saying is like being a model of being the first to do something you know, I'll, I'll be a little partisan for a second. It's probably not a surprise to anybody. I was spent eight years in the Obama administration, was not particularly happy with the outcome of the 2016 election, but I really did, <laughs> it's putting it mildly. But, but one thing I said in all the, you know, hand-wringing conversations we had is that these four, hopefully four years, could be a time to experiment and learn. Like the worst thing we could do, we, whatever, you know, is is if the opportunity comes back in again to legislate um, in a progressive manner, to only have the same ideas we had in 2016. We should have new ideas in 2020. We should know a little bit about whether they're good ideas or not and how to do them. And so places like, you know, it's why I spend so much time actually here in California, even though I live in Boston and DC or in Seattle, um, seeing some of these exciting new ideas sort of working out on the ground and learning. Sometimes some things work, some things don't work. But to me, that's the best, That that's the only silver lining on this, these four years of not really being able to legislate at the federal level in a progressive manner. So I don't, I don't you know, I will admit, I don't think as much about international, like, uh, the, how that interaction, but I see a lot the of- The role model and experimentation makes yeah. complete sense. Okay, I'm getting a sign that we're within our 10 minute window. So um, we're gonna have John, Art, and uh, Maria offer their comments and then we'll take- Wait, Can I just say one thing about Roy's last question though about the ability to communicate with other workers. So in our clean slate recommendations that will be coming out next week, we do have a recommendation to address this issue that, that employers uh, have to create digital meeting spaces. Mm. That it, it, you know, we all have this, well, those of us of a certain age, you know, fall on this phrase of um, like the conversations around the water cooler. Too many workers don't have a common water cooler anymore. And so this idea of creating digital meeting spaces that cannot be surveilled, yeah. but where workers can really connect with each other, um, we thought was a really important idea and, and right. a way to, to show how the law has really not kept up. No, I think mean, just to echo that, I mean, a big part of the recommendations we're making around tooling is precisely to facilitate um, collaboration and communication, but with an awareness that if, if the boss builds it and says, here's where you can have a conversation now, people will not use it. So there has to be a very clear, um, bright line that says, no, this is, this is specifically to facilitate people collaborating, not to surveil them. Great. Thank you. Okay. John. All right. Uh, thank you very much to both of the panelists. Um, I think Londa said at the beginning that really the heart of the issues we're confronting we're going to be taken up in this panel. I think it's absolutely correct. I think you also said something about the nuance that we need to be sort of reaching for. And I totally agree. I think the challenge we face with like nine minutes left here, <laughs> it, it, given the enormity of this topic, it, we just have to acknowledge the limitations here. And unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get there. But this is the key. Um, uh, Professor Gray, uh, I'm so glad we got a chance to talk last night. Uh, as you know, I really enjoyed reading your book. Um, and I got to express to you all the things that I really uh, appreciated about the contribution. Uh, so please forgive me if I shift to some of the more critical elements right now in this intervention. I think there is, as we take a step back and consider all of these big questions, a very serious risk of the narrative of technological inevitability that these technologies are almost a force beyond our human capacity to shape and redirect. Mm -hmm. And I just don't accept that. So again, I, I love the ethnography. You're, you're raising up the human face behind these apparently mechanical uh, and, and AI driven systems. I think that's extremely valuable in so many ways. Um, where you begin to lose me was in, in the sections of the introduction and conclusion that cited some of the, the broader data studies. And I hear what you're saying about the, the limitations and the challenges in our ability to know the data. I just have a different take on some of those studies that you cited and think that there's even some more recent studies by those same authors like Katz and Kruger. I think it's a, there's a more recent study that contradicts that earlier study that you cited. I don't wanna get into details now, but it's so important that we be as empirical as possible to not play into that narrative. 
because I'll tell you, here in California over the past year, that narrative of inevitability has been explicitly used to tell workers, you have to reduce your ambition for demands. Mm. You have to reduce your hope to gain more rights. You don't have a choice. This is happening and it's going to come whether you like it or not. So I just really want to, I guess, ask you to reflect on that and, and, and encourage us to continue to revisit um, that data. So um, thanks again. And let me shift to, to uh, Dr. Block. Um, you know, I really, what's that? I said not doctor, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> oh, excuse me. All right, all right. She's a uh, professor, I'm a counsel. professor. Um, uh, you know, I really, um, I, I got to read an earlier draft of the, the Clean Slate Report, and I'm very eager uh, to read the final draft. Um, I think a lot of the elements that you cite in there are, are kind of uh, parallel to what's in the PRO Act, for example, and mm -hmm. I was expecting or hoping you would mention that as well, because that's another concrete set of proposals. The majority of the Democrats in the House have already endorsed it. I think concretely there's a lot that we can do there. Um, so if you can speak about that. In terms of sectoral bargaining, you know, we have this situation where I think a lot of the popular press has picked up on this as though it's going to be an easy fix. Somehow the European has just figured out this other way to do it, and that's why they have more worker power there. And obviously power doesn't uh, seed, you know, uh, power that easily. And so, um, Sectoral bargaining is kind of in the eye of the beholder. At the UFCW, we engage in sectoral bargaining in Southern California with our multi-employer contracts. It's a positive uh, tool that, that we utilize. For historically excluded populations, agricultural workers, domestic workers, absolutely, it makes a ton of sense. I think the challenge is where you get into this question of independent contractors who may be misclassified. And as I understand the Ninth Circuit ruling, in order to get around the antitrust concerns, we're again going to be have to put in a position where we have to give up some significant scope of bargaining and delegate it to a state authority in a way that I don't think meets the needs that I hear from workers in that sector every day. And so I just want, want to put that out there on the table. Great, thank you. Yeah. Quickly respond Before, to that. Actually, I, I'd want to, yeah. because we're down to five minutes left for everybody's questions and answers. So I'm actually gonna go through everyone. We're gonna come up with the list and I'm gonna ask you guys to respond to those things where you have not done any writing about it. Because if you've mm -hmm. done some writing about it and we can kind of pull that into the materials that we already have, I think that that's probably the most effective use of the time that we have. But I think it's important, it's really important to yep. lift up all and surface all of the questions around the table before we, get to, before we, we close out this session. So why don't we go with Art? Thank you. So Sharon, if I can call you Sharon rather than Professor or whatever, <laughs> my preference. and Mary, um, this goes mostly to you, Sharon, that is, I think you hit the nail on the head when you were talking about um, um, possible law in California that addressed the independent contractors. So let me give you a little background. There are two million independent contractors, I think, in California. At least a million of them are misclassified. That is, the employers uh, don't want them to be employees, and so they call them independent contractors. So we, we were circulating for a while in California as a result of the Dynamex decision by the California Supreme Court, um, which I thought was a lifesaver for us, um, that um, we create what you suggested, which is a new law, like the, like the Agricultural Labor Relations Act we currently have in California, um, that uh, would um, create these, we'd create a a California employee status, but not a federal employee status because of the problems with the preemption issues with the NLRB. And um, you suggested something in there about that, and uh, I'd be curious about what you have to say about that. We ended up deciding not to do that because we, we ended up deciding to put that on hold for a while uh, because it was along with AB5, but we decided to focus on AB5 first. Um, and that is... Um, I want to say one other thing about that, and that is, um, well, we included sectoral bargaining, actually, also. So, um, but we decided that we couldn't do it because many of our folks said that um, we needed to still have employee status in the, un, under the federal law as well, which is sort of an inherent conflict, I think, with the state employee status. 
I wonder if you can address that issue for us. Right. Okay. You're, you're jotting down your questions, right? Yes. Okay. Good. Next is Maria. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentations. I really appreciated uh, learning and hearing from your perspective. And in the spirit of time and spirit of being additive, hopefully. Um, Sharon, I just wanted to pick up on your comment related to the corporate boards and wondering in that recommendation in terms of uh, what kind of risk assessments you could speak to uh, related to that. My experience um, from a corporate board perspective is that there's a lot of other agencies, both at the federal level and at the state level, that have oversight and very specific rules as to board member qualifications and things of that nature. Uh, so I would just be curious in your in your assessment of calling that out as a recommendation, how you viewed that balance. All right, thank you, Maria. Doug's gonna ask his question. I will, I will try my <laughs> best to be brief. This is cuts to 25 years of my life's work, this panel. And so I am very passionate about it. And I wanna direct my comments to Sharon where I've been very happy to participate in the Clean Slate Project because in California, labor unions and workers have absolutely tried to push the envelope and do everything we can to give workers more power, uh, recognizing that we're preempted federally under both the National Labor Relations Act and for the Teamsters, under the laws that deregulated trucking in the 80s and the 90s. And we keep hitting our head against those same walls. Um, that being said, as some of my fellow commissioners had alluded to, we came up against some real existential questions this year, looking, starting with a UC Berkeley Labor Center report that estimated that platform-based workers represent less than 1% of the workforce in California, and a small portion of the 8.5% of workers who are classified as independent contractors, many of those who are in Teamsters jurisdiction who we believe are misclassified employees. So the question became, yes, should we try something new? And this Ninth Circuit ruling you alluded to came out of a Teamsters campaign to get Seattle City Council to give Uber and Lyft drivers the right to organize. But could we write new rules in the state of California without destroying the old rules? And I want to get some facts on the record here for this commission to understand because our union does more private sector organizing under the NLRA than any other union in the country. And the NLRA and the NLRB have a lot of problems, as you know. But just in the last five years, we ran 315 elections. We won in 55% of those. More than half of the units were under 25 workers. And for those small employers, we won 72% of the elections. When it came to workers at workplaces where there was already a Teamster contract, a Teamster employer. So one worker could go to another and say, I'm a Teamster, this is my union contract. You join the union, you're gonna get something like this. Our win rate increased exponentially. And we do multi-employer enterprise-based sectoral bargaining too. We pioneered that in trucking. So, yes, a lot of reform needs to happen, but I also want to piggyback on uh, John's question about the PRO Act and reform efforts that you see this commission in the state of California could support at the federal level, because the, a lot of the problems at the federal level and a lot of the solutions could be found there as well. Right. Next, Mariana is going to ask her question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be brief. <laughs> I'll be brief. Well, thank you for um, first just uh, highlighting the historical exclusion 
um, of NLRA, um, of agricultural workers and domestic workers, specifically to not allow black workers build bargaining power in this country. And that's still the case. Um, we're coming up to a century, a century, less than a century later. Um, in the spirit of experimentation, um, you know, this question around bargaining and building bargaining power for workers is one that we have been sort of focused on in particular because there isn't a clear path for domestic workers, not only because of the legal exclusion, but because pragmatically you have an extremely disaggregated workforce. And um, in addition to the sort of the gig economy and the online platforms, we are seeing more disaggregation and fissuring in the economy. And so we hope that uh, as we sort of experiment, we are able to have um, models or replication for other work for, uh, for other sectors. So we were able to win a standards board. And so it's similar to the wage board, but has a much more uh, like broader scope beyond wages and compensation um, in the city of Seattle, where it's a tripartite board of employers, workers, and um, in this case, the, the city of Seattle, um, to come together to sort of negotiate and set standards for um, across for the, for the industry. And this is something like based on Seattle, um, we modeled our federal, our national bill of rights to include a, you know, a standards board. And we're looking at other sort of cities and states to kind of replicate it. But it, you know, it is an experiment in sectoral <laughs> bargaining, um, but for our industry and I think others where there is very small employers, I think this is sort of a direction that we need to go in. Um, and I think that uh, I also appreciate you using the word worker. Um, as domestic workers, there's such a diversity of work arrangements that in some ways, the issue of classification or misclassification um, only solves a very small part of the the problem for workers, not only in terms of securing a floor, raising the floor, but also um, also being able to set up ways for them to build power and continue to bargain for better and better jobs. Great. Final question is going to go to Saru. Can you can you hear me? <laughs> Um, Sharon, this is for you. I came to the, uh, when I came to the, one of your many convenings with the European uh, folks from Europe uh, who are talking about the sector-wide collective bargaining agreements that they have, they said, um, we, we were all like, oh, what you have is so great. And they said, yes, but what we're missing is some kind of engagement of people at the shop floor, mm -hmm. you know, um, we have these sector-wide things and there isn't much kind of direct interaction between people on the shop floor and then their sector-wide agreement. And so um, in my mind, that got me thinking that the way we should be thinking about these is some kind of combination for large sectors like domestic workers and restaurant workers and others that are non-unionized. We should be thinking, dreaming about not just the big sector-wide thing you said was the number one thing you said to Mary Kay that we should be thinking about, but parallel to that, some kind of workplace engagement or voice that's structured. Um, and so I've been developing ideas about that, but I just wanted to, to know, in your mind, when you said the one thing, would that one thing be just the sector-wide thing, or would you do it together, kind of thinking about sector and workplace together? Okay, so it is very clear that we're not going to get all these questions answered <laughs> because we are well out of time. So I'm going to ask you each to choose one or two to respond to in one or two minutes and to really think about the relationship of those to the future of work, and again, to things that you haven't already written about with the assumption that our staff team will make sure that we collect from you things that you have written about and highlight those so that those can get folded into the conversation. So let's start with Sharon. Great, so I will say on AB5 and the connection to collective bargaining, written about that, Ben and I wrote um, an op-ed about that, so um, I feel like that that's out there in the PRO Act. You'll see when our report comes out, in a week that we adopt everything that's in the PRO Act, so yes, and I think that's the answer on, on PRO Act, it's yes, and. But I really wanna to get to Sarah's question because this is really important and we absolutely took that lesson. I mean, that was like, 
big aha moment. Uh, we very much don't want the United States to become France. In France, everybody's covered by a collective bargaining agreement, but nobody's a union member. Uh, so again, next Thursday, you'll see in what comes out in the final clean slate report is very much a system that hopefully creates incentives and pathways and invigorates uh, workplace bargaining at the same time of, of creating uh, sectoral bargaining. So it isn't adopting any like, oh, Germany knows how to do this. Let's just do that here. We really tried to think through the connection between those and even then broadening the connections to what happens in the boardroom, what happens in the public square. But we absolutely heard the same thing and took took the same lesson. And if I could just say, so the Seattle, the, the standards for domestic workers, that's exactly the kind of experimentation that we can be learning from. So that when we have this chance to legislate at the federal level, we know how to do it better. And NDWA has been an amazing partner in Clean Slate. So we've definitely learned learn from that. Thank you. Uh, so I haven't written as much post book. I've been in a lot of conversations about thinking that the question that you brought up, John, and I, I just want to keep emphasizing, there's nothing in this book or anything I've ever studied that's about technological determinism. Most of my career is built on interrupting that narrative. There's nothing inevitable about any of this. What we're, what we're watching here is what's this mechanism that is um, able to find somebody to do work, schedule them, manage them, um, be able to ship and bill particular kinds of services. Where do we see it billowing out? And we're looking at hundreds of startups in every single sector. Healthcare is awash in them with companies that want to take on some piece of that mechanism. So it's, it's, it's that piece. Do we imagine there's probably a role for legislation to play in saying just-in-time scheduling should be illegal? Yes, it should be illegal. In settings where just-in-time scheduling is about shift work and it can't address um, somebody being able to find a list of tasks, it's, it's not useful. So with most of the work that we're doing here is to think about how can we look at what is this mechanism doing? What kind of role is it playing across different sectors? And what are the kinds of employment relationships that are, that are being created? I don't know what to do with the fact that we don't have a good way of measuring how much of this work is growing. And I've spent five years watching it grow. And then folks will come back and say, it's only 1% of the, of the worker base. We don't know that. No one should be making strong claims about how many people do this work. I'd say I've spent a lot of time looking at people who have come in and out of a number of different sectors. They don't have language for what they're doing. So I think we all need to be incredibly sensitive to, for me, going back to Mary Kay's question, when I think about the Valley, I'm looking at people who are um, going in and out of seasonal work, who have always done service work. This doesn't look radically different. It's not because they're low skilled, it's they're paid poorly because they have no cultural power they're incredibly intelligent people able to serve others. So the opportunity here is that there's an amount of this work that actually can be done remotely. <coughs> and to Roy's point, because I want to try and tie those together, that if we could care that somebody is in relationship in an employment relationship with peers and firms and care less about whether they're documented as a California citizen or a US citizen, we would all be better off. Mm because odds are pretty good that a number of these companies that we're talking about would benefit from having workers who they could call into their HQ in the Bay Area, but they don't have to live there. So this could be ideal for addressing, and I will just say for the number of interviews we had where people talked about not having to be in long commutes as part of their calculus. They were weighing the cost of being in a car for two hours to get to a job that was a service job, that would likely not pay them much and would mean they'd have to pay more in, in, in childcare. So I would like to see the opportunities here and, and I'd also like us to be much more um, uh, invested in getting to a measurement that's meaningful rather than making large claims about whether this is growing or not. Thank you. Um, if you're like me, you're feeling 
frustrated because there are three more hours of conversation that we should be having that we're not going to be able to, to have right now. However, I did want to call your attention to a piece of paper that is in your um, folder, which is around solution sets, which, and the reason we're trying to be disciplined about our calendar or our, our agenda this morning is because we really do want to get to the solutions. And so we put some of these forms in each of your packets. They're about um, being able to address some of the initial solutions, being able to tee up some of the ideas that we want to make sure that we're able to combine and uh, collect. Um, and so I think a lot of what has come out of this conversation, both the, the comments that we heard here as well as all of the questions and comments around the table, really do speak to the next piece of work that we are going to do this afternoon, which is really surfacing what some of the, the solutions are to many of the problems that have been identified. So I just wanted to draw your attention to that because there should be a few opportunities for you to jot down those ideas and, and link them also to both the problems, to some of the actors, and then to how we think about categorizing them in terms of time frame and, and scale. Um, before we break for lunch, and we are going to do that now, um, I wanted to see if Jennifer Gilmore is anywhere nearby. Is she here? She's coming. Okay. Um, Jennifer Gilmore um, runs Kitchens for Good, which has been feeding us this morning and this afternoon. And she's going to talk for two seconds, well, two minutes, about her organization. And um, they are a, a social enterprise, an employment social enterprise. She'll give us a sense of their mission and their programs. Um, the lunch will be in these two rooms. Uh, as usual, the lunches for commissioners and um, Institute for the Future and uh, staff only. Unfortunately, we can't extend it to everyone. Um, we are going to take uh, a full 30 minutes for lunch and then come back in the afternoon and make sure that we are um, able to do some work that is going to be around solutions. We'll do a brief readout of last night. So for those of you who weren't able to join us, you get a sense of just how incredibly um, dynamic of a conversation that we had. Um, last night and how that I think also begins to set the frame for what we're going to do this afternoon. And then we're going to break into some small groups as we did in Los Angeles, I believe. Was it Los Angeles? It was Los Angeles. Uh, we're going to break into small groups in that um, and, and do some deeper thinking around some of these solutions and we have a framework for doing that. So that is uh, the agenda as we think about breaking for lunch. I don't know if Jennifer is coming. Doors opening, and there she is, as if on time. Jennifer, do you want to come to the front and say to talk for two minutes about Kitchens for Good? Yes, I would love you to just need to be mic'd because we're we're live across the state. All right, thank you. <laughs> so, welcome. Uh, my name is Jennifer Gilmore, and I have the privilege of serving as Kitchens for Good CEO. I had an opportunity to meet a couple of you last night. Um, thank you for including me in that incredible event. Uh, also, thank you for selecting Kitchens for Good to host your meeting. We really appreciate it. So Kitchens for Good was built on the belief that all food has power and all people have potential. We work with individuals who have significant barriers to employment. This includes individuals who are re-entering from incarceration, youth aging out of foster care, people who are living with mental health challenges, homelessness and addiction. And we provide them with the life skills and the knife skills they need to get and keep jobs in the culinary industry. I ran here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Take a breather. All right, back at it. <laughs> In four years, Kitchens for Good has trained 300 individuals. 90% of those individuals have been employed upon graduation, and 87% remain employed two years after graduation. Among the population that has been incarcerated, our recidivism rate is less than 5%. Wow, Compare wow. that to the state average of, I think it's around 50%. Catalyst Kitchen, which is a membership organization that works with um, culinary job training programs across the country, says that our outcomes are higher than the norm. Uh, that our students are more successful than usual. And we attribute that to success to two things. One of them is we're a social enterprise. And what that means 
is that we have the opportunity for our students to gain on-the-job experience that complements their training. They can come and hone their knife skills, and they can hone their show up to work, be a great team player, and follow direction skills. It also allows us to provide them with a paycheck. Every one of our employees, our students, is hired the first day, and they are scheduled to work in the social enterprise for five to 10 hours a week, and they get that experience of getting a paycheck. The other thing that has a significant impact on our student success is the California Apprenticeship Initiative. And we were able to receive funding through this initiative to begin and establish an apprenticeship program to be a cook. And what that means to our students is that once they graduate from Kitchens for Good, we continue to work with them and their employer to ensure that they are learning new skills, to ensure that they're mastering proficiencies, that they're getting promotions, and that they're getting pay raises. And when they finish, that apprenticeship program, they receive a certificate from the state of California that's the equivalent of an associate's degree. And for our students, some who have said the only thing they've ever completed was their prison sentence, that certificate means a whole lot. So the future of Kitchens for Good. 2020 is gonna be a great year. We're welcoming class 20 in a couple of days. Um, we are going to continue to grow our social enterprise earned revenue stream. We're going to be expanding into our third kitchen, and we're going to be launching two new apprenticeship programs, a baking apprenticeship program and a hospitality management program. Thank you again for picking Kitchens for Good as your host site. We really appreciate it, and we really hope you enjoy your lunch. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. We'll, be, well, we'll convene at 12, at 1.15. Thank you. Oh,